Гості, я прошу вже всіх займати місця, щоб ми могли розпочати нашу роботу. Please kindly take your seat so that we can start. Uh, feel free to take any vacant seats so that we can start our proceedings. <coughs> this country and the citizens of the past four years, we've been living uh, in a very stressful environment faced with formidable challenges. Uh, political, economic uh, processes have uh, put a lot of new and unexpected uh, challenges on our agenda that uh, both the government of Ukraine and society at large have had to address a year ago. A very important and very stressful event took place. And we appreciate uh, the implications uh, and the ripple it, it, it caused in society when one of the biggest banks went into uh, nationalization, having lost its ability to uh, settle its liabilities. It happened. Actually, the preparation had, had been very important leading up to that. Uh, several uh, NBU officials joins the, the IMF because they, they were not prepared to face that challenge. So it's just to, to impress on you the, how important it is that that was a really uh, groundbreaking uh, process in of itself, and it involved a number of uh, personal and professional decisions that some people had to make. The bank was eventually nationalized, but it did not affect the settlement processes, uh, a large army of depositors and average citizens does not suffer. It did not uh, cause any major impact on the system as a whole. There was no bank run, there was no outflow of deposits. There were some scenarios that had been uh, developed uh, that uh, involving banks uh, fully compliant, uh, meeting all regulatory requirements, capable, even faced with a crisis, to, to meet client orders. Those scenarios had all been developed, but they fortunately never materialized because the nationalization process was run in such a way that it did not affect the day-to-day -day, uh, life and business as usual within the banking sector. Many issues, however, remain outstanding. Many questions uh, remain unanswered. Not all decisions have been made. We would like to uh, explore how this experience reflects uh, when compared to other countries who have been through something similar. What we did just the way they've done before may be some things that we could share as uh, a better experience. And to uh, explore that, we're happy to welcome our uh, representatives from uh, Lithuania. I will be joined by Mr. Vahe Vadanyan, is currently in a meeting with the Prime Minister. Maybe they're still assessing the damage caused to the market or something. He'll, he'll, he'll join us shortly. He'll share some thoughts, some considerations, his impressions. Uh, let's listen to our international partners uh, and how their experience has been useful to us and the extent to which uh, we are sort of in tune and in sync with uh, prevailing European practices, if you will. Uh, we uh, will now invite our colleagues to speak and then we'll have time for questions and answers. And uh, this will be followed by a panel discussion uh, 
a more, a more lively one, more interactive with plenty of opportunities for you to find out more, and uh, maybe, uh, maybe a balance of some some of your concerns that you want verified or discarded. To, to give a presentation in your event. So, yesterday evening we had a very pleasant dinner uh, with, with the staff from the Central Bank, and uh, we, we wanted to make an impression, and we were telling that uh, we had uh, liquidated two major banks and several and other credit institutions, and we heard from, from the colleague that uh, you have liquidated something like 100 banks over over the last couple of years. So I'm not sure if, if you will learn from us or we will learn from you, but but nevertheless, I will I will try to, to share some experience we, we had over the previous years. So my presentation will basically uh, be consisted from two parts. I will tell uh, something about uh, these two main main bank failures we, we, we have faced since 2011, and then uh, I will share some some thoughts about the lessons learned and, and the way forward we see uh, cleaning up our our financial system. So let's start with the with the with the, the biggest case, the Snorras Bank, and um, as you can see in this in this picture. Uh, the former owner and, 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 and the chief executive for the last 10 years before the failure looks like a very modest and, uh, and decent person. And uh, no one could have expected that something shady is happening in the bank. But actually it was. Uh, it was a fourth largest bank and it uh, had about 10% of the market share and uh, insured deposits was around 3% of GDP at the time, so quite a considerable amount. And they, they reported the book assets was, was uh, 2.3 billion uh, before the failure. Uh, but then we, when we made the intervention and the, and the temporary administrator took over the bank, uh, it seemed that, uh, that the actual value of, of assets was basically one-third of, of the reported value. So it was a big hole in the bank. And uh, we, we, first it was a nationalization, so we took over the bank over, 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 over the weekend. We had to change some legal acts, some laws over a couple of days because we, in 2011, we didn't have uh, proper tools to, to, to make an authorization, to, to make proper resolution uh, 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 exercises. Uh, but then uh, over, over the weekend we saw that the hole in the bank is so big that uh, it's impossible to have a, a viable business with, the, with, the, with this bank going forward. So the decision was, was made to liquidate the bank and to pay out the, the deposits. And um, in 2011, it was still a, a post-crisis time, so it was quite hard for the government to borrow uh, enough money to, to pay out 3% of the GDP. So, so it was a tough decision, but, uh, but I think it was the right one because uh, there was no, no, no future for, for this bank. As you can see here, the, the, the assets were, were increasing exponentially over, over the last couple of years before, before, the, before the failure. And um, our former supervisors always had some suspicion that something is, is, is maybe wrong in this bank. And it's only 40% of total assets were, were the, the green color was invested in, in domestic lending. And all other 60% were, were investments in, in foreign entities. Or, or, or commercial papers kept at foreign depositories, and uh, and uh, and if some line of the assets was was becoming suspicious, we, we gave some orders to to lower this 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 part of the balance sheet. But then the other part uh, popped up immediately, so so they were just you know shifting uh, these bad assets from from one line to to the other. So uh, the reason of the failure is is pretty sure. It was the suspected as asset embezzlement uh, actions of, of this um, decent and modest uh, uh, persons uh, ruling the bank. And uh, 
there were some 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 simple symptoms. So quite a lot of assets uh, were related to, uh, to lending to non-residents, and in, in in East countries, about six percent of total assets. Uh, it was quite a lot of investments in offshore companies, uh, uh, which was very difficult to to assess and and, and evaluate. Uh, it was a lot of liquid assets, so-called liquid assets, but it um, was held somehow not in Lithuanian depository institutions, but in Switzerland. And, uh, and in 2008, when we had uh, some volatility in deposit market uh, during the global financial crisis, uh, these assets, which were claimed to be very liquid, they actually were kept, were, were kept constant, and the bank had to sell not so liquid assets to cover up the, the, the deposit uh, volatility. So then it, it gave us another reason that something wrong is happening with, with these assets and we need to contact uh, Switzerland and, and to ask uh, where, whether this money actually exists. And the answer was that, uh, that, that they are not. And then it was kind of a final drop and a final answer for us to, to intervene into the bank. And uh, of course, it was a lot of another exotic assets. The bank was the owner of some media groups. Uh, the bank was uh, owning two car companies, the Swedish Saab automaker and the Spiker cars. Uh, they were making sponsorship for Formula One team. And uh, of course, uh, they were owning a football cup. <laughs> and. Uh, Another, another very clear feature, they, you know, if you run such a business, you need to hide it somehow. And, 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 and the base, best way to, to hide this is, 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 you know, to, uh, in our case, it was to, to, to do a lot of sponsorship, uh, to appear in the mass media, uh, to show up yourself and, 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 and um, to, to kind of pretend to be a, a decent citizen, which, which you know, who, who, is, who is sponsoring a, a national economy and, and, and uh, sports teams. So, of course, it's, uh, the fraud is by nature very hard to detect. And it was, of course, respectable audit companies uh, hired to, to, to make an audit uh, for, for this bank. Uh, but, uh, but it was exceptional demonstration of power and wealth uh, of, of former, former owners of the bank. So another case, uh, it's Uke Bankas. And here on the right, you also see a very modest and decent uh, owner uh, 10 years before the failure. And uh, he's together with our uh, biggest star in basketball, which is a second religion in Lithuania, Arvinda Sabonis. So again, he was uh, trying to, to be close to, to, to famous people and to kind of cover, cover up uh, the things is happening inside the bank. So Uka Bankas was a, a bit smaller. It was the seventh largest bank. And uh, it was uh, taking about 5% of the market share. Uh, and, uh, and, and the deposits were a bit more than 1 billion euros. Uh, the total assets was a bit more than 1 billion euros. Uh, but again, the real asset value was, was uh, basically half, half of the reported one when we made the intervention. Uh, but uh, with, with Uka Bankas, we went through another scenario. Our legal laws were, were changed, and we, we could make a good and, back, ba good and bad bans, bank split in this case. So we were not liquidating this bank uh, entirely. Uh, but again, uh, the problems uh, were, were, were suspected as a, asset embezzle embezzlement. So around 50% of the balance sheet was uh, connected to related parties, close, close allies of, of the former, former owner and chief executive of the bank. Uh, it was uh, very exotic and, and, and exceptional collateral uh, related to the, to the lending. Uh, very big uh, sports complex in, in Moscow and, and other countries, which was very difficult to value. Again, uh, a lot of foreign assets, so a lot of lending to, to, to offshore companies. And uh, of course, uh, yeah, a lot of money spent to, 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 to gen generous sponsorships. Uh, so what we did with Vuka Bankas, uh, so be before the intervention, the, 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 the assets was around 4 billion litas, which is a bit more than 1, 1 billion euros. Uh, but uh, when we stepped in, it seemed that it's only 55 or 60% of these assets is, is actually existing. 
and uh, and that was uh, considerably lower compared to, 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 to the liabilities of the bank. So we went through the good and bad bank split solution. So we took some part of good assets and, uh, and insured deposits, and, and our deposit insurance fund covered up the remaining amount. So, so, so they um, uh, injected around 260 million uh, euros, and, and we sold this good, good part of the bank to, to another commercial bank. Uh, and, uh, and the rest went to, to the liquidation. So I think uh, this was a bit more smooth uh, solution. So, so your depositors, uh, after a couple of weeks, they, they, they were um, uh, capable to, 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 to get access to their, to their money and, and the client relationship was not lost as, as in the first case when, where, when the bank was liquidated entirely. So some lessons uh, uh, we learned. So of course, uh, it was not an easy way, and uh, we we had uh, we we were learning from from our failures basically, uh, but uh, but we made some conclusions, and and basically we made uh, two fundamental conclusions and, and 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 some more practical. So first of all, it was a big question for us. We it was of course always some suspicions that something is strange happening in the bank, but it was always a question. But how can the bank operate if half of the assets is, is not existent. What about you know the income of the bank? Uh, it, it's not possible to, to operate like that. So maybe it's everything is fine with the bank, uh, but actually, uh, as long as you know the liquidity inflow of liquidity into the bank is bigger than the outflow. So as long as you can attract some deposits, and this amount is a bit bigger than you know the outflow of, uh, of, of liquidity from the bank, so the interest paid and so on, then the bank can, can operate basically for, for many, many years. And uh, these uh, things also happened in other countries, in USA, in the Madoff scheme, the Ponzi scheme was operating in, in for 80 years. So it's really quite easy to hide things in the banks and, and, and to operate for a number of years, even uh, uh, without you know, uh, having, uh, uh, having only one third or 50% or of, of assets, actually. Another thing is that uh, uh, since banks and many other countries, uh, you know, they are limited liability companies, so, so basically the shareholders can you know, lose quite small amount. The, the maximum amount they can lose is, is their equity. Uh, but they can gain, you know, uh, unlimited uh, profits. So if they invest in, in the market portfolio, and this portfolio, no, is, the price is growing, so, you know, your gain is, uh, has no limits. So it's very asymmetric incentives. And uh, even if it's a, a worst case scenario and this equity is, is you know, Funded by, by by bank loans or or you know other other sources, so it's basically it's not your money as a, as a shareholder invested in the bank. Then then this asymmetry is is getting even worse. So uh, we made we made some practical solutions uh, from from this experience, uh, and we, we took some 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 lessons. So of course supervision is is basically a slow and legal process. So so you are always kind of chasing the tail and you're always uh, two steps behind the bank and uh, and it's always easy you know to to be on the safe side and to and and to to to, to you know follow formally the legal acts and just you know to kick to kick kick down the can down the road and and to kind of postpone the solution but of course uh, it's uh, it's the problem is only getting bigger over time so the sooner you intervene the the less consequences and the and the lower losses you will you will incur uh, external advice uh, we also uh, when we saw that something is strange happening in Snora's bank we we just simply called Swiss colleagues and uh, uh, Swiss supervisors and, and we asked them to to give us some information about the assets held held in Switzerland and uh, and believe me it was quite quite a good cooperation they, they sent an answer and, uh, and 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 we we took uh, the following steps so so it, it worked 
we also try to kind of corner the bank. So we 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 gave some time limits for the bank to you know to show uh, that this money is existing to transfer at least part of this money back from Switzerland to Lithuania. And we asked to transfer back just five percent of the money, and they failed to do that. So it was another 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 kind of lesson and uh, an example that something is wrong. And uh, in the end, uh, as a supervisors, I think we need to be a bit more risk taking. Uh, so yeah, if it's a 50-50 chance that uh, our our actions will be successful, we, we need to take a chance and to, to do it. Otherwise, we, we will not be moving forward. Of course, uh, we, me we need more discipline in the banking sector. So. As, as I showed you, this asymmetric incentive. So the more capital the banks have, uh, more skin in the game is 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 is, is no at, at on the table, and that will lower uh, the 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 risk appetite uh, for the banks. Uh, Risk-based versus rule-based supervision. Again, uh, we need to be flexible and and not you know follow formally legal acts, which is very very kind of static. Uh, we need some effective resolution mechanisms because uh, yes, liquidation is 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 is, is one option, uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a quite painful option and it it uh, creates some some volatility in the market. And we need uh, preparation, of course. So we need to run, uh, and uh, Vida will talk more about how we prepare for the resolution uh, actions. Uh, so it's a very long and and and, and thorough process. Uh, we you need to you know uh, make some crisis management exercises and so on. Uh, and uh, and of course communication is, is is also very important. You need to explain why why you're doing this and that, and 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 that helps to to, to calm the, the the public and, and the markets. Uh, so that was all I had to tell you, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for your. Uh, statement for your comments, but uh, only one uh, uh, issue I would like to clarify. This bank, commercial bank you mentioned, which bought part of this problematic bank? Yes. What about this ownership? Is it was state ownership mm -hmm. or private ownership? So it's very important for our experience. Yes. So this bank was. Uh, Basically, privately owned. By, Thank by, you. Yes, yes. But uh, but uh, part of the ownership was also coming from the European Bank of uh, Reconstruction yes, and Development. So so that was a good good partner again. Because there are a lot of idea in our country that one state-owned bank can or should buy another state-owned bank. Thank you so much you. for your contribution. Why the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much for the invitation and opportunity to speak here. As my colleague Simonas was speaking about uh, the actual cases we had in Lithuania, I will talk more about the new resolution regime in the European Union. And also, we already had the first European resolution case, so I will also talk about the experience we got from that, uh, from that resolution of the bank. So then the bank fails. The problem is that the money is not there anymore. And the main question is who pays the price? So who gives the money that is gone? And uh, the answer developed throughout the time. I will talk a bit about this evolution. And uh, hopefully, we have arrived at the right answer finally. And that is resolution. So. Before this regime was in place, there were basically two options. First option is bankruptcy. And maybe this can seem as a natural choice than a private company becomes insolvent. Insolvency statistics in the European Union shows that 500 companies go bankrupt in the European Union every day. 
and it doesn't shock anyone. It seems to be a very natural process in the free market. However, uh, it's not the same for the banks. And uh, it, during the bankruptcy, the price should be paid by the creditors and investors that invested in the bank. However, uh, in fact, society has to pay a big price as well. And the good illustration is the case of Lehman Brothers. I think all of you know about this case and even in the financial world or banking world the time sometimes is counted before the Lehman and after the Lehman for the very right reason. So in that case the regulators thought that uh, the bank should fail. Like as any other company the bank should be allowed to leave the market on its own without any help from the state. However, its importance was misjudged. So no one actually f could, could think that uh, confidence and trust is imp very important. And it's very important in the financial markets. Actually, financial, financial markets are based on trust. And if you remove this base, then the subsequent collapse is happening. Uh, Lehman's was not a regular deposit-funded bank. It had a lot of connections with the rest of financial system and then in bankrupt no one could uh, work out their position so no one knew who is solvent and who is not so the wholesale funding just froze for some time and those banks that were borrowing in these short-term wholesale markets to invest in a long-term projects got into a big trouble and it was just catastrophic consequences for them. So it was clear that uh, maybe Lehman shouldn't have went into insolvency as such, and some other <coughs> choice could have uh, been made for this bank. And the price that uh, was paid, it was not only like creditors or shareholders, but very wide, even global society that had an implications from this particular failure. So unless the bank is really small and insignificant, then the bankruptcy is not an, an option. So what was the, the other option? The second option is for the taxpayers to pay the price. So it's a it's bailout. Taxpayers pay. Contagion risk of contagion is low. It seems that this could be maybe a clean option to deal with a failing bank. However, it's not so innocent as well because the banks are becoming really large. Their <clears throat> contribution like becomes very big in the society and sometimes the price of the bailout that countries had to pay was like around a half of their GDP. For example, Ireland to bail out banks had to to pay 40% of their of their GDP. So of course this gives consequences for such country. Significant budget cuts, increase in government debt, and it affects negatively, negatively the real economy. Of course, there are examples when states got profit out of such bailouts. Then they subsequently sold this bank to the market and they made a profit. However, it's not always the case. And then bailout happens, it's not clear that this will be the actual outcome. So, um, so more information is also needed from the regulator side then they're taking this decision. However, they have to act quickly so they don't have so much time to investigate and evaluate what would be the right choice for that bank. And of course, such implicit guarantee, it also gives negative incentives for the investors. Before the resolution regime, investors could rely that the governments will bail them out. So they could invest in any bank without really having to consider if it's having a good business, making good investment choices. And uh, the banks were getting cheap money, they were investing them even more, so banks were growing even larger in size and becoming riskier. So the incentives were very wrong. Investors were getting all the profits while taxpayers would get the loss if things go wrong. So something had to be done, this became clear, and after a financial crisis, the answer was resolution. So what do we do? 
we have to plan and prepare in advance. We need to remove information asymmetry that happens when the bank is failing. And the second thing, we have to prevent the use of taxpayers' money. So we have to shift the responsibility and losses back to the shareholders and investors. And uh, very important question is how do we do that? So our answer is resolution planning and bail-in, a very important tool. I'll talk about it a bit later. So resolution tools are just like simple ways what do you do when the, the bank gets into trouble. So you can sell it to a, another bank, you can make a bridge bank if there is no purchaser at that time, you can separate bad assets and sell them not on fire prices but like keep them till the market is ready to absorb that amount or that type of assets or bail-in. And of course institutions need to have powers to act. And even like they have to be institutions who are responsible. For example, in the United Kingdom, before the financial crisis, no one was formally responsible for dealing with failing banks. There was this informal understanding that the central bank, like the Bank of England, will take an action, but it was not formally written in any kind of law. So of course, this has to be done. There has to be an institution that is formally responsible. And that institution has to prepare. It has to plan in advance during the good times what it would do in case the banks get into trouble. And also, very importantly, also banks have to prepare. It would be, I think, naive to think that the banks could act and their business could operate in the same way as it was before. So new resolution regime does not only mean that the institutions and laws are changing, but it also implies that the banks have to change as well. And resolution planning institutions have to have ability to make those banks change. And of course, the ability to act during the crisis is very important. If creditors or shareholders would be able to block the resolution process, it would not work. So no consent from the shareholders or creditors are needed. Of course, they can contest it into, in the court, but they can't stop the process. So their application to the court should not mean that we kind of freeze everything for, you know, till the court proceedings end. So the institutions need to have full rights to take the necessary actions when the time comes. So the speed is very important in, in resolution. And now talking about bail-in, so what, what it is, how, how does it work? So in a healthy bank you have equity, you have some bail-inable liabilities, and then you have covered deposits and liabilities that you shouldn't touch, so like, like we call it non-bail-inable liabilities. So these are important for the bank and economy to, to run in a proper way. So when bank has losses, equity is written down. So the equity is like going concern, loss absorption capacity. And sometimes it's not enough. So then the bank fails. So then we need to have like a pillow of liabilities that we could convert into equity. So those who were previous creditors of the bank, investors in the bank, they become new shareholders. And then this bank with a slightly smaller balance sheet can come back to the market and meet the regulatory requirements again. But uh, as I was saying, not all liabilities can be subject to this bail-in, to this transformation from the investment or from the liability to equity. So of course secured liabilities, that's why they are secured, so they are they have the particular assets assigned to them, so they shouldn't be touched. Like They trust that these assets are in place and uh, they will get repaid from these specific assets. Or operational interbank liabilities. If you bail them in, maybe the bank will be kicked out from the payment system and then it can't operate. So of course you can't touch these kind of liabilities. And then liabilities arising out of critical goods and services. And if you ask like, what is this critical good and service, then there is no straightforward answer for every single bank. You have to see what, what what is critical about that bank 
So maybe some part of its activities is critical and some are not. So you don't touch the critical ones, but with with those uh, activities that are not critical, you have more freedom. <laughs> and how do you make it work? It, this is especially relevant for the deposit-funded banks, like traditional deposit-funded banks, because when crisis happens, you need to have some bailinable liabilities that uh, you could convert into equity. And sometimes the bank's balance structure is so straightforward, like equity and deposits, and there is nothing to bail in. So that's why resolution authorities can request a bank to hold this extra pillow of liabilities that would be used when banks get into trouble. So in the European Union, it's called minimum requirement of eligible liabilities, MREL. Globally, it's called total loss absorbing capacity, TLAC. So I think these terms are, are known to you already. And uh, so in a way, you can understand it as a resolution capital, like a gone concern loss absorption. And it's very important that banks have it and that it's clear, like which of the liabilities can be bailed in. Because of course we want to avoid panic then uh, when, when you start like uh, bailing in without a clear structure. So investors have to know in advance their sequence. So once the shareholders are wiped out, they have to know that it's their place and uh, they have to accept it as a natural way of the new functioning of the bank. That's why these liabilities have to <clears throat> have to have some um, conditions. So a very important condition is that eligible liabilities can't be redeemed for a, they have to have maturity of at least one year. Because if there won't be this kind of maturity requirement, then banks get into trouble, they would quickly go away. And of course, then you won't have anything to bail in. And in a year, if they are locked in a bank for a year, then of course, when things go wrong, they, can, they can't escape. And after a time passes, maybe the situation changes and they don't want to escape anymore. Or if the bank actually fails, you have some liabilities that you can transform into capital and keep the bank operating. <clears throat> and here I come to the first European case that happened this year in June. Of course, it wasn't the first failure of a bank in the EU, like clearly not. It's just like the first bank that was um, dealt with under the single resolution mechanism of the Eurozone common rules. And as it's the first case, of course, it got a lot of attention and uh, it, it was very important that it would work and actually it worked. So even when I talk about the resolution regime as a theory, we have now also a practical case that proves that it can work. So like this bank was uh, a large bank in Spain. It had assets of like around 200 billion euros. So before the shock, of course, assets and liabilities match. But uh, during the shock, uh, it appeared that uh, the assets are less than liabilities. And it was not that, um, uh, how to say, like large, uh, large loss. The bank was solvent, it just ran into liquidity problems, so it had to be closed down. And it had to be done very fast, so the result of the evaluation that uh, was done provided the result that the losses of the banks may be between 2 and 8 billion. So, of course, some shares and capital instruments were written down, but when you have, don't have a precise number, it is a bit of a guess how much do you need to write down to make, uh, to make this work. So this part of the Banco Popular was acquired by Santander, the acquirer. It got uh, all the assets and part of the liabilities. So around 4 billion uh, euros of liabilities were written down. So we have less liabilities, we have more of the assets or we have all of the assets, but we are not so sure about the exact value of the assets. So there is this kind of six billion unclarity. 
what do we do about it? So Santander got all of it. The final result could be that if assets match liabilities, then you could say it's a good deal. Like those shareholders and creditors who lost their money, there was no assets to back them, so it's fine. Santander didn't make any profit. It got like assets and liabilities exactly matching. It is clear. What if assets are less than liabilities? So actually Santander acquired more liabilities than assets. You could say maybe Santander didn't make such a good choice, but it's, the, it's, you know, it's their business choice. So if they have to live with that, they have to cover the loss, the loss they got. Uh, it's very important to, to note that uh, the government didn't make any guarantees for the assets or liabilities, so Santander just took the assets and liabilities as it was without any strings attached to the government. But uh, what would happen if assets are actually more than liabilities? You may say that those shareholders or investors lost their money. Maybe this deal was not so fair for them and maybe they should get compensated. And the European answer to that, that is that it depends. So the safeguard that shareholders and creditors have in this situation is comparison between bankruptcy and resolution. So the benchmark is not the best deal you could possibly get from the sale in the market, but actually what would happen in the bankruptcy. So the valuation is done, the bankruptcy price they would get is established, and if the resolution gives uh, the result that is smaller, so they lose more in resolution, then they are compensated. But if not, then even if the assets would turn out to be larger than liabilities, they are not getting a compensation. And a very important aspect is like, who pays the compensation? Is it taxpayers again? Or there can be other ways to deal with that. And the European regulation said that there should be other ways than taxpayers' money. So banks have to pay into resolution fund. They have to make ex-ante contributions. Then they are running healthy. They pay annually to the resolution fund. And once, the, uh, once some compensation is needed, then out of this fund, the money is taken and paid to the uh, investors or used for other purposes in resolution under like very strict conditions. So it, it means that actually th the banks have to also pay the price for, for the resolution as such. So this seems to be, at least to me, a very good system. It seemed to work in this uh, one case we have, but uh, Will it always work? And are there some, are, are all the questions answered? So of course, there are questions that still requires answer. So where is this lo loss absorbing capacity is placed? Like, is it subordinated? Like, is it clear who is getting the hit when the bank fails after shareholders? Then how much of this loss absorbing capacity we need? Is it like, uh, the same as like asking banks to hold like twice or three times more of the capital, or how do we balance the requirement to have this capacity without like uh, uh, making the life of banks uh, too difficult to operate? Then who holds the bail-inable debt, and how do we make sure that when we do this bail-in, that uh, there is no subsequent uh, uh, runs on other banks, or that the banks are not interconnected now through this bail-inable debt and the domino effect happens. Also, what about cross-border cases? Like, are we sure that the authorities wouldn't start ring-fencing the banks once they get into trouble or it can be dealt with as a group? Then, of course, will the bank have market confidence? Who provides liquidity? There still are unanswered questions, but uh, the way forward is, of course, to the very right direction. 
And you may ask, so can we be very confident now that we will never ever need taxpayers' money again? Of course, this is a very tough <laughs> question. And uh, the answer is that it... <laughs> It's a quick question and the answer. So the question is very, very good, very valid, and very difficult. And the answer is that not in all the cases. There may be exceptional circumstances, like very exceptional circumstances, when the resolution tools don't give the right result. So it's uh, possible that in a large systemic crisis, even when we use all the resolution tools we have and we shift the losses to the creditors and shareholders, it still doesn't give us the right result and the financial stability is affected. So then the government may step in. It doesn't have the duty to step in, but it's like the right to choose. Only in these extremely systemic difficult situations and only after we use the resolution tool. So the creditors and investors take the hit. That's the precondition before any kind of government uh, action. So uh, this may seem that the implicit guarantee is returned, but in fact, it's not. Like the rating agencies, they removed implicit guarantee from uh, when they are evaluating the banks. So investors cannot rely on it anymore. They have to make their investment choices. They have to assess the actual bank, the risk they are taking. So this is a very positive step forward, and it, it happened even before the first resolution case when they saw it works. So the fact that we had this new regulation in place resulted in such an effect. So this is a very positive advancement. But of course, having the regulations in place is not enough. As I was saying, the banks have also to play their part and adapt to this new world of resolution. And of course, it is not cost-free. It will cost them to change their organizational structure, to have this pillow of eligible liabilities, but that is the price they have to pay to operate in this market. So thank you, and if you have any questions, I'm here to answer. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, as, uh, uh, Answer, uh, question answer session we will have after the okay. last presentation, but uh, very important uh, comments. Please. While listening to uh, the example of, of Lehman Brothers, uh, Mr. Shock Speck recalls his conversation with Christopher Freeland, who is now uh, the uh, uh, Commerce Secretary in, in Canada. Uh, and she, she at that time was a journalist. She, 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 they had a chance. They had a, uh, an interested Korean investor at the time. But they were so large, they kept really putting on airs that, that, that they were 200 years old. And they thought that, that they, it was not worthy of them. They thought to to accept that, but the Korean investor would have actually uh, picked up all the liabilities, and the, the following day they crashed. A very important message that institutions should be empowered; they should have the full rights to take the action. But coming from Ukraine, this is what it's important: is the those institutions should also have the commitment, the will to act, not only the powers, but and to make them want to do it. It's just at all those institutions collectively responsible uh, for nationalization processes, all the stakeholders should be committed. It's not that somebody or one agency is responsible and going around talking to all the regulatory ends, everyone is taking a wait-and-see position, waiting for that to end and then act when it has ended. So it's important, this solidarity, consolidation of government institutions, government actors. We, there is no audience here. Everyone is an actor. Everyone should act together, should make their contributions and share this responsibility together. And then back to the point on how to minimize the risk for any uh, gaps being 
uh, covered by taxpayer money. This is really very relevant for Ukraine. If we were to just, if we did, did some maths in terms of how much the government has laid down uh, as investment and this is the share of either shareholders or creditors. Uh, over to to Vakha. So Vakha uh, has been here for, for, for a long time. So uh, our friends only arrived yesterday. And you've been in charge of financial reform for a long time. Yes. Um, talk in English. Um, actually, um, it was very good presentation about the logic of, of, of moving to this BRRD framework. And the whole is done to minimize, the whole idea is to minimize the usage of the public funds, which is why these bail instruments are to be created to make sure that it would not happen. And the same resolution fund which is created in Europe is specifically done for those cases um, as well. So like in the case of the deposit insurance, when banks are paying to get some coverage when, when it's needed, in the same way, the same logic works for the resolution uh, funds. One of the important things to bear in mind that the, those bailinable instruments, um, it was rightly mentioned, um, in the non-matured markets when there are no capital markets matured, it's going to be very, very difficult for, for the regulators to come up with such. However, it would be important in the Ukrainian case as well um, uh, to already in the near future to implement that, uh, that regulations that would enable down the road the creation of, of such instruments. Um, another important thing um, uh, that with the introduction of this uh, BRRD framework, the importance of the resolution authorities has been increased substantially. Um, and there have been special framework introduced, which is called recovery resolution planning, uh, which is significant part of the uh, uh, of that directive, which implies that a lot of work should be done ex ante, both by the regulator and the resolution authority, to get properly prepared for potential resolutions. That is is one of the, the important things to be done because um, as it is done in Europe, it, it was for a long time done in the United States, the most important thing to do the resolution quickly. Yeah? Usually it is done over the weekend. And to make sure that it would happen, these two institutions have to work and get prepared hand, hand in hand, yeah, to work together to make sure when time comes, both of them have very concrete tasks um, to implement. Um, the re recovery and the resolution planning implies, um, though to be frank, it is defined mainly for systemic institutions, uh, because um, in very few um, European countries, the resolution of the smaller institutions is envisaged. Usually the smaller institutions go to liquidation and the BRD framework by its nature designed for the systemic, uh, systemic institutions. Um, uh, nevertheless, even in that case, uh, the, one of the most important things uh, should be um, the introduction of this framework when banks themselves first prepare the recovery plans which is submitted to supervisor and agreed with the supervisor and then based on the recovery planning already resolution authority together in conjunction with the with the uh, supervisor are building their own resolution plans to make sure again when the time comes um, they would have uh, enough preparation for that another important thing to bear in mind that the introduction of um, BRD framework has given more powers and some enforcement powers to resolution authority per se, though it is perceived that it is highly unlikely that the resolution authorities will use them because there, very, there is very good cooperation um, in Europe between resolution authorities and, and, and super, supervisors. But nevertheless, the resolution authority 
legally has the power to request banks um, to change their business models to make them resolvable. Yeah? Initially, this resolvability analysis should be conducted, and if they will see that, for example, banks are not resolvable, um, they can request uh, to change the business model to make sure that they can spin off the parts of the business, the systemic parts of the business, and preserve that part when the time comes. Um, this um, is the work that's already undergoing in, in Ukraine. Um, yeah, uh, together with authorities, uh, there is a working group which works specifically on the design of the new resolution framework to make sure that in, in, at some point in the future there would be possibility to converge from the current bank resolution framework in Ukraine as closer as possible to BRRD directive because um, uh, not all the stuff would be would be right way implementable in Ukrainian realities. However, yeah, the most important thing again is to to create this culture that the, the MBU together with DGF will get together prepared for potential resolutions down the road. Another important thing, um, and I, I, I should have talked also on the Regulation 575 of, of European Union, in. Um, in parallel of, of building this um, uh, resolution framework, a lot of work has been done to build up the supervisory side. Um, um, uh, the Basel III Accord that most of you are, uh, are, are aware of um, uh, came uh, to substantially increase the requirements both from quantitative and qualitative perspective to the, uh, to the requirements to the capital. Yeah? New components to the capital has been introduced um, uh, to more specific or capital conservation buffers and counter-cyclical buffers. One is the measure to make sure that there would be buffer for idiosyncratic risk, but the second one is the component that brings macro prudential aspect of of banking supervision to make sure that the banks would um, would have enough capital um, in the uh, in the bad times to cover the systemic implications of possible crisis. Yeah. There are also special requirements and under Basel III framework, which is imposed for the uh, systemic institutions. Yeah. Uh, there, the, the, both on the local level and more specifically um, for the so-called global uh, systemic financial institutions, there are extra requirements up to 2.5, up to 3.5 percent. Um, uh, there are 30, if I'm not mistaken, close to 30, 27 or 30, close to 30 global institutions that already um, yeah, uh, keeping much, much higher capital than the minimum requirement. Um, so all these efforts um, uh, has, been, has been put together to, from one side, make sure that there would be significant enhancement on the regulatory framework. The quality of capital has been substantially strengthened. Yeah? A lot of mixed instruments should be phased out, and the major um, the major change was to make sure that there would be quality capital of high level that would be loss absorber. Yeah? Um, in Ukraine, capital structure is is yet um, is 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 yet uh, even not closer to Basel II. It, it's it's closer to Basel I. But on that perspective, also um, the central bank is is doing a lot of work to try to bring those new instruments and new structure, um, uh, hopefully, in the near future, that would be, um, yeah, would be accomplished as well. Um, uh, we would like to push nearest future, uh, <laughs> um, this new uh, structure. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, if, if it's possible, it would be great, because it should imply that the quality capital should 
more specifically, Tier 1 capital and additional Tier 1 capital together should constitute 75% of the, of the total capital requirement. In Ukrainian case, the capital adequacy ratio is 10%. The new framework, if we will not take into account the uh, capital conservation buffer and countercyclical buffers, just the pure Tier 1 and additional Tier 1, which is not yet existing in Ukraine, together should, should be 7.5%. If you look on the current framework in Ukraine, uh, the capital adequacy ratio implies 5% um, uh, quality capital, and banks can keep up to another 5% of the subordinated debt, yeah, of, of capital kind instruments, but which are not really um, uh, the loss absorbers. So if there is um, desire on the banking side, and there is possibility for the bank owners um, to top up enough capital to bring those European um, standards to in Ukrainian realities that early, that, that, that would be great. The, the, the quicker, the better. Um, what we do envisage that um, uh, most probably there should be some phasing period for banks to have possibility to gradually converge because it is not going to be only pure um, capital structure requirement. There would be a lot of other things in parallel, more specifically to the requirements of Basel II. Um, the substantial work on the supervisory side should be done to, for introducing Pillar 2 of Basel II. Yeah, those instruments are not yet fully exist in Ukrainian realities. A lot of work should be done to introduce Pillar 3 of Basel to about disclosure um, requirements. So all this stuff um, will, will need time. And it is, in my view, would be difficult to pick two, three more specific issues and work only on those. Um, rather, the approach would be to try to have complex approach um, to introduction um, of all those concepts, and more specifically, those should be go hand in hand in the for the introduction of the new resolution framework, because a lot of um, uh, the resolution new resolution framework by its nature. Um, uh, begins from early intervention framework on the supervisory side. So these two concepts have to be developed and introduced in parallel to make sure that um, there is proper understanding and cooperation between MBU, in Ukrainian case, and Deposit Guarantee Fund. So both of them uh, would have proper understanding on what is the early intervention framework for the banks and at which point of time the triggering of resolution could happen. As of now, um, the Ukrainian, in Ukrainian realities, there is this two triggering point when the banks announced as a problem bank first, then they go to the insolvency. The new bank, BRRD, a resolution framework, have one triggering point, which, which, is, which sounds like the bank has failed or is likely to fail. Um, so it is kind of a mix of these two stage approaches that exist in Ukraine, and it would take some time to internalize and 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 structure the proper transition from the current resolution framework to the framework which would be closer to the to the European um, uh, structure. Um, and the very, very last comment on the bailable side. Um, um, as I said, in, in countries which do not have matured um, uh, capital markets, um, and as was rightly mentioned by a Lithuanian colleague, if you look on the balance sheet of the banks today in Ukraine, the ma ma major part of liabilities are deposits, of retail deposits, and um, while in reality, BRRD allows um, the bail-in um, of non-covered deposits. However, I mean, the likelihood of this happening in European realities is very, very low. And if you look on the balance sheet of Ukrainian banks, um, it, it kind of the first that comes to the point that there is nothing else to bail in, only depositors can bail in. Um, however, we do believe that if the proper regulatory framework is there, it could enable the generation and uh, the appearance of such instruments down the road. Um, 
However, how exactly it would be structured, it is yet to be discussed. The working group is working. And whether at the end there would be decision to bail in some depositors or not, I, I assume it's, it's something yet to be discussed, but um, I'm not sure that there would be desire for that, to, to, to bail in depositors. Um, I'll stop here. Uh, I'll stop here, and I will take any questions more specifically to Ukrainian realities if needed. Thanks. Thank you very much for, for your contribution. Prior to moving on to uh, our short questions and answers, just to make a couple of comments, just uh, from what from Vahe's talk, that he argued that bank resolution should actually turn around fast over the weekend. It's it's what we've done, but you know what that that that, that uh, memorable weekend. It, it, that over a year of, of, of preparation had gone into preparing for that weekend. And it's it's a call to all stakeholders. It's not only to the regulators, it's the, the banks. The banks should change its business model rather than keeping up business as usual, keep sitting on what they, they always held and, and, and only asking for more money from the government to cover their losses. As more losses arise or, or, or new holes in the, in the capital open up. What is really very rewarding to hear, and this is something that we look forward to, to uh, Ukraine embarking on, that whenever a bank has been nationalized, it should start uh, selling off, spinning off some parts of its business and raise money to to, in order to uh, to minimize the uh, the price paid by the taxpayers, and it's really very rewarding to recognize that both the regulator and our esteemed partners providing uh, uh, technical assistance to Ukraine that we are putting our heads together, together with market participants, and and we are all advocating for 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 a new deal in terms of new capital structures, new market instruments that should be generated that could be qualify as bailinable so that banks eventually set enough capital aside for the rainy day. Look, it, like we're gathered here and everything seems normal, normal and, and it's like still a normal time, but we should prepare for, for crises in advance. We don't have much time, but it's just to let you ask any questions. Who would like to start? Please introduce yourself. Viktor Zich from Hvila, an online media outlet from Dnipro. Two questions. Uh, the famous economist Andri Larionov has been criticizing the National Bank, especially referring to 2015 when Look, if you uh, take the, the courage uh, to refer to somebody as famous, famous where? Uh, world famous, now working in the United States. He is he no, well, he's known in Ukraine and Russia. How famous he is in the US is anybody's guess. Okay, but just let me finish. Uh, when talking uh, this this may at the Ukrainian Institute of, of, of the future he was like he showered criticism on the national bank's interventions during 2015 2016 that actually what was uh, really conducive to the crisis that we we are all having to grapple with if you uh, don't you find that uh, based on what we heard so far in the current circumstances is the is putting money under the mattress the safe the, the safest option now rather than putting taking money to banks? Uh, so when the, the the why Mr. Speck intervened uh, about him being famous famous where? So, so it's a, a big a pro proponent of uh, okay. So where he is now based in the United States, there are economists who are a lot more famous than he is, if you uh, read what they are writing about this. So this very complex and painful uh, processes that have evolved when the 
since Ukraine's banking sector went into uh, reform. It's most economists uh, have actually uh, spoken in a positive tone. All leading economists, uh, leading uh, authorities um, from the World Bank, the IMF, claiming uh, global acclaim and having a lot of experience globally in uh, trying different uh, instruments. So while respecting Mr. Ilarionov's viewpoint and and celebrating and com and respecting his right to voice his opinions, Mr. Speck would like to use his prerogative as president of the national uh, of the uh, independent bank association in Ukraine. We proceed from the viewpoint that the reform currently underway within the banking sector is probably one of the few reforms in Ukraine that has succeeded. And against the background of depressed economic growth, that the banking sector is recovering slowly but steadily, recovering its profit profitability. This is not something that uh, we are hearing from Ukrainian bankers, but from citizens, uh, from their day-to-day -day interactions with the banks, as deposits have re-embarked on a growth path and local currency lending has resumed. So, uh, Mr. Speck would like to strongly encourage you, you or media representatives, please do not listen or, or else only heed one economist, but seek plurality. Like, putting money under the man mattress or in, in, a, in a glass jar, it, oh, yes, it is, a, it is a safe haven. You're putting money there, but there is no accretion of capital is what an, is an essential service that a bank provides. This is, it is your choice. You make your choice of bank. But it is our uh, duty together with banking regulators to empower by give you by giving you more knowledge, by increasing your awareness on how to make an informed choice and make a choice between the 89 banks that, that have survived and your a glass jar or your mattress. It's, it's, it's an option, but it's just that you're not going to make money on, on, on your savings. Alexey Blanov, Alpha Ball. To our Lithuanian colleagues on this, uh, your Snorris case of resolution in the other bank. Uh, so in your presentation, you uh, were talking that it was much about uh, regulatory ambiguity, if I may. So you cannot push. But when it is obvious by the formal rules, it is obvious it is far too late to intervene. So from your experience with those two banks, can you elaborate what is the balance between you know, these formal or regulatory rules and your uh, ambiguity in taking this decision? And the second question, which is maybe very important for Ukraine, for what's your experience, uh, it is likely when you intervened into these banks that you had this media campaign, maybe initiated by the former owner. So what was the PR strategy by, for the central bank to tackle this? Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, Yes, it's a, it's a very hard balance between these formal rules and, and, and really proactive actions. So, uh, but I think it's, uh, rules are rules, but it's also very important how do you implement these rules. And you can implement it very formally and you can you know, hide under your table and, and, and pretend that you do not have any measures at your hands. But you can also look at these rules from, from different perspectives and you can find some 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 tools and some options to, to, to use the resource. So I think it's uh, very important to have a right attitude from the regulatory institutions um, and to look to, uh, with, with different eyes to the, to the rules. Uh, but it's also important, uh, I think, uh, in a way we can say so, to take risks from the supervisory perspective. So uh, we had many options, uh, many, many instances when it was 50-50 chance if we if we will take a right decision or not, 
but we took a risk and 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 some decisions were, were right some were wrong but but without uh, you know and have a ailing. glass of champagne okay. yeah 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 okay. <laughs> you know I, i think Wayne Gretzky once said that you, you know if you want to hit a target you need to shoot if you're not shooting i mean you you will never hit it so you 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 need to do something and uh, regarding the media campaign of course um, All, all these, you know, shady banks, they, they invest in this makeup and, 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 and they appear in the media and it's uh, really hard, uh, hard to fight uh, against it. Uh, but uh, yeah, we just try to do our job uh, the best way we can and we try to explain it in a simple way to, to the public. So that's, uh, that's our option. Thank you very much. Константин Медяник, актуальна права е журналист. You stated that uh, that the banking sector was recovering, uh, bank, banks returning to profitability, but according to Ukrainians, the National Bank of Ukraine is a failed system. It, it hasn't had a governor for six months already. Gone to the on leave, but she's sort of still present there. It is still. Uh, in the dark, when banks have failed, but okay, some people find out earlier and take their capital out, even though financial monitoring authority is supposed to, to conduct oversight. How is that capital flight and why is, is it not picked up by, by financial monitoring? Now, we, we are down, uh, down to 89 banks. Maybe there are some other banks in the pipeline Uh, that are going to face a resolution, maybe their shareholders are already taking out all capital they can, they can, they can possibly take out. Who is that uh, question uh, uh, directed to that? Uh, uh, it is, Mr. Speck is really very uh, grateful and appreciates uh, the two, the two uh, uh, really hold him in such esteem uh, as an authority on banking, being uh, uh, the chairman of a banking association. Can you please uh, turn his microphone on? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's the, the market. Uh, there is a, the sup a supervisory agency that's responsible. Uh, Mr. Speck uh, it, it has worked with each governor of the National Bank of Ukraine and he's known each and every one of them. And if you look at what's been accomplished recently, at, since 2014, around this period of time, the seeds were sown, had been sown a lot, a lot earlier than, than recently. So we, as whenever you say, we Ukrainians, we are seeing this or we are seeing that, Please bear in mind that we started out with a very large number of banks without a business model at all, engaging in uh, in the type or types of business that was not fair banking. The reckoning time has come, and depositors, taxpayers. It's because you know why this came to a head because other. Uh, problems in society are, are getting uh, more pronounced. So it's not being a big advocate of Ms. Gontreva, but it's under her leadership that treatment started, therapy started, and the problems that had been built up over the years. It, it had to, it couldn't simply, it wasn't sustainable any, any longer, given the challenges that we were facing economically, socially, and, and otherwise. When just summarizing the uh, the contributions from 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 our speakers, that well, like a, you when you recognized uh, a problem, you act on it. In ABN Amro in the Netherlands, they saw a problem last Friday. Then the prime minister gets together and he eats lunch with a uh, governor, and it get, and goes into nationalization. Uh, the following Monday. That's what Vahi was uh, emphasizing and that Mr. Speck was trying to, well, just to uh, really 
indeed uh, persuade you that, that, that the, the weekend had been preceded by uh, over a year of preparations. It's, it's government institutions and, and, and whoever has the power to make those decisions, to implement those decisions, they have to be prepared to discharge their uh, role. And we've come a long way, we Ukrainians. Mr. Speck is, is, is Ukrainian too. We should discard and cast aside any populism in making our judgments. Because tomorrow we're going to elect a new government. Who are we going to vote for? Now, on the subject of capital flight, uh, Mr. Speck knows uh, those people, uh, those about, those people who had a chance to extract capital. He also knows some bona fide owners who knew it was coming and they didn't do it because they didn't lose, didn't want to lose their rep reputation. We have to uh, be able to uh, delineate between the uh, the duties of different institutions. Like, it's too late to ask why did financial monitoring not do their job? Why was no criminal investigation, prosecution? At why nobody st stopped them? Maybe we should also uh, put some blame at the doorstep of our banking supervisors, but this is not something to be asked of the National Bank of Ukraine. We only wish we had representatives of the law enforcement sector in this audience. But it is their job, too, to go after uh, such offenders. Why is it? We shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, labor under the illusion that it never happens in civilized countries, but it is when people do wrong, they get punished, and they and in Ukraine people do wrong, and they never get punished. That's the difference. If we look at those institutions, are they acting, sometimes doing, fulfilling their roles, or else uh, engaging in, in skirmishes with one another is something that we keep uh, reading about uh, in the press. Yes, the regulator should have their share of responsibility. But it's the law enforcement sector and the judiciary should also do their bit. And, and also the same applies to uh, former bank owners uh, who are running their banks without a business model. We know that since 2014, uh, up to 90 banks have been resolved. Okay, Privat is, is, is like is, is a a big case, and it will take time, but we will need to do a lot of analysis uh, uh, in an ex post fashion. But it, it's like it's it's out in the open, out in the media environment. But we we are not hearing much about the smaller banks. But when we emphasizing that responsibility should be there, everyone should shoulder their fair share. When discussing the, uh, the European directive and principles, for our Lithuanian colleagues, we're saying, okay, they are. Uh, now safe and they because they have the European uh, agencies and institutions and regulations we oh, relative to you we are still very far from that so it's like like Mr. Speck and Valky, maybe we may you may be discussing a new instrument or new capital structures and it's specifically discussing how to uh, go about implementing the, the BRD directive. But it's not that. The primary requirement from the EU, and it actually sits in the, in the Maastricht uh, agreement, is that uh, the government of a country that wants to build the relationship with the European Union should faithfully shall faithfully discharge its role and serve its public. And this very, this fundamental principle, unfortunately, uh, has yet to be fully uh, implemented in Ukraine, with some agencies not doing their job, but like fighting among themselves. Konstantin uh, Fasovets. For Lithuanian colleagues, um, do you have any experience uh, with bail-ins of liabilities, uh, cross-border liabilities, liabilities that have been protected by 
uh, different laws, right? These would be something like Eurobonds, for example. Uh, maybe this is from your practice. And how do you think these should be managed and what kind of outcomes can you expect from these sort of proceedings? Uh, thanks. So now when we have this BRD, like Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive in place, it should work because in the European Union, we would have the same rules that would apply. So everyone, all the union is playing by the same rules. It hasn't been tested yet. The framework is rather recent. And as I said, we just had one case and it was sale of business. But uh, within the EU, there is no, I don't think there are obstacles. If, we, if they will show up, then of course the legislation will solve them. But then the question is how do we deal with the with the other countries outside the EU? And uh, it is a, also a very important question, especially now also with the uh, Brexit. So if we see that the liabilities are governed under the third country rules, like outside European Union rules, and if we are not confident that we will be able to bail them in, if their rules are not uh, as rigid as those in the EU, we don't count them to the, this MREL or maybe TLAC, the like, analogy of TLAC within the EU. So the bank would be asked to have liabilities that are governed with the laws of the EU. So then, of course, the, those other countries will also get the pressure to adapt their rules if they want to do the business, if they want the banks to buy these instruments, they would have to make sure that they have the proper laws in place. So I think this is a, this is a good balance, and I believe it uh, it would work. Uh, just one comment: uh, Would you go about bailing? Like, if you if the rules weren't exactly matching, right? If you couldn't be sure that you would be able to. Um, build them in according to EU laws, right? Would you, in, in, in case of a bankruptcy, would you go ahead and still and try to bail them in? Uh, would these be the creditors that should be paying for the cost instead of, you know, the taxpayers? Or would you just leave them alone? What, what would probably be the, the choice there? The default option, bail in. That's, uh, that's clear. If it doesn't work, like we make the attempt, but somehow, you know, they, it doesn't work, we go up with the creditor's hierarchy, and we do subsequent bail-ins. So like, that's how it's going to, to happen. And then these, I would say, legacy uh, attempt to bail-in would happen subsequently. So we won't just uh, put the taxpayer's money instead of that. Of course, and I was talking about this no creditor worse off principle, if it would be clear that maybe we have to bail in so many creditors that bankruptcy would be a better option, they would get a compensation. But it doesn't, uh, doesn't mean that we would simply put uh, taxpayer's money instead of those liabilities that can't be bail in OK, thanks. Thank you, dear colleagues. We should. It's it's time to uh, to take coffee break and get ready for the next session. A lot of interesting speakers will be talking during the next session. You probably are looking forward to hearing from them more than from Mr. Speck himself. But if, just one last question for this session. None. Thank you. Thank you. Now, well, then we uh, we take a coffee break and we are back here in 25 minutes. Thank you.
We I think we have your attention now. Of this panel this discussion, uh, quite frankly, there is a lot of interest in, in this particular part of, of our event. And uh, questions will be asked, just as um, usually done uh, when hosting radio shows, but just to to keep everyone on track and to the point uh, in uh, discussing some of the uh, questions already asked by uh, by the journalists. So we are discussing the, the nationalization of private bank, uh, but it's it's very similar to some of those uh, comedy movies. It's like it's like a movie scene in uh, in a way. So it's just to start. Why don't we first introduce the the panelists? We uh, this event is also being uh, webcast on the Naboo website. This Naboo, we have two Naboos. This is the the one Naboo is the only one that is legally registered as Naboo. Uh, this is you are going to address this maybe separately, Miss uh, Katerina Roshkova, a deputy governor of the National Bank of Ukraine. Uh, who is uh, in charge of banking supervision, Mr. Roman Spak, uh, president of the Independent uh, Banking Association of Ukraine, a former vice um, prime minister, Vladimir Vlavrinchuk, whom many know as a composer, as a singer, and he also happens to be the CEO of Raiffeisen Bank, uh, Aval, one of Ukraine's largest banks, on the record of the DGF, who is responsible for uh, selling off banking assets from failed banks and Mr. Yablonovsky from the uh, reanimation reform package uh, and your responsible for economic strategy. Just to start out by sharing some st statistics with you about Privat Bank as a one presentation, if we were to compare uh, the balance sheet of Privat Bank as of the 1st of October, year over year, over the 1st uh, of October 2016. It looks like the, there's not much change. Uh, the nominal value is only changed by 6%, slightly edged down in local currency speaking uh, of uh, total assets. If we look at uh, deposits, client deposits uh, have grown by 2%. Uh, specifically 3% uh, in retail deposits, and m some of that comes from foreign currency translation. We know that at least half of those deposits are denominated in foreign currency, and a slight only 1% decline in corporate deposits. At the same time, we've seen quite substantial changes in some other balance sheet items. We've got something we're going to address if you look at uh, uh, loans in local currency, 72% increase in retail loans and 26% increase in lending to corporates. And we understand that provisions have uh, also increased uh, to a total of 191 billion uh, grivnes uh, as of the 1st of October. So it's just, just throwing those numbers out to you. If, if, if somebody needs to make a correction, feel free to do so at an appropriate point. Now, we'll begin by uh, handing over to Dmitry Yablonovsky in his presentation. He's going to speak about uh, a strategy uh, of uh, state property management. The presentation is in English, so the speaker prefers to switch to English. Remarks uh, regarding what, what should the state do with nationalized banks. Basically, we have one nationalized bank, so the focus will be naturally on this particular bank. Uh, first, I would like to to to, to mention that uh, the problem of nationalization is not unique to Ukraine. Uh, we already had uh, quite good examples and discussions in the in the first panel, uh, and you see here that uh, there were quite many examples during the uh, previous uh, financial crisis in Europe, but uh, not only during the crisis, but after 
after the crisis, there were also some cases of cases of na nationalization. In Ukraine, uh, in uh, 2016. Uh, Ever, we had a previous strategy for state banks, but then uh, everybody, as you all know, occurred the nationalization of private bank, and uh, uh, the consequence is not only the problem of nationalized bank, uh, private bank itself, uh, but also that the state, uh, as an owner, uh, got the dominant position of the state on all segments of banking services. Uh, what was private bank before nationalization? It was the biggest bank in Ukraine. Uh, it was considered by many experts as the most innovative bank. Uh, it had also leading positions in uh, services for small and medium b business, and also uh, uh, almost 60% uh, of banking cards were issued by uh, private bank. So uh, uh, what happened after the nationalization? Uh, the state injected uh, almost uh, 140 billion hryvnias into the capital. Uh, the major problem of the bank was that 97% of corporate loans uh, had uh, were issued uh, to related parties, and most of them uh, are non-performing, if not all of them. Maybe National Bank uh, can correct me in this. And also, uh, currently, uh, because these uh, loans are not serviced, basically, uh, the revenue is generated mostly f uh, by the, from the bonds, and uh, these bonds uh, generate lower revenue than the interest rates on the deposits, uh, which results basically in, uh, in the losses for the bank. Uh, also, there are uh, several lawsuits, boys, uh, both by the uh, bondholders and ex-shareholders, which also uh, create additional problems for the uh, operations of the bank. And you see here the uh, total result of uh, state, uh, the total consolidated result of state ownership. Uh, this is uh, the result after the second quarter, uh, and I guess after the third quarter, uh, the share of state as the owner of banking assets, uh, I guess it even increased. And you see here that really after na nationalization of private bank, the state got dominant position in almost in all sub-segments of the banking market, uh, varying from cards to a number of branches, uh, to customer funds, uh, to loans, etc. Etc. So, uh, before moving uh, to the, our, at least our opinion on what should the state uh, do with a nationalized bank, uh, let's consider what what are the state banks for or what can be used for. And from theory, and uh, the usually uh, stand, state banks are considered uh, to be uh, kind of creators of special social value, which is not created uh, by the private banks. So uh, they can be other development banks or they can promote financial inclusion. On the other hand, uh, there are risk, uh, risk, substantial risk in owning, uh, in ownership of st uh, state banks, and which are, uh, this is basically applied to I, uh, worldwide, but also so particularly in Ukraine, because uh, we believe that state is a less competent owner. Uh, also, the state can use the state banks to finance the state budget, uh, which we have seen in Ukraine for quite a lot of uh, times. The state can also finance state-owned enterprises uh, through the state-owned banks, and this is also topical, uh, as we see for Ukraine. And the state can influence politicians' business uh, in case of state capture, and we have also cases for this in Ukraine. So then waiting out uh, the risks and benefits uh, of uh, state ownership of the banks, we believe that uh, the risks outweigh the public benefit. And what is uh, the recipe, the remedy, the remedy is to privatize the state-owned banks. If we try to apply this logic to private bank, uh, we try to think if there is a special, unique social value which it creates. On the one hand, it, it does. It, really is an innovative bank, uh, uh, have very uh, good uh, digital, digital services, but on the other hand, it's not something unique. It, it can be also provided by the private banks, but on the other hand, uh, there are risks associated with the state ownership of the bank, and uh, there are also risks that all this innovation will be a little bit slowed down because, again, uh, uh, the state as an owner is not that active in promoting innovation, but on the other hand, in particular case of private banks, there were some services which were not completely legally justified. So uh, the, the, the state bank, the state private bank uh, stopped providing some services because of the legal issues. And uh, 
as a, as a result, uh, we, we, we of course would like uh, the private bank to be privatized, to become private again. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we have already mentioned with the, the problem with the structure of the balance when you have deposits on the one side and uh, government bonds on the other. So uh, in order to do this, of, of course, we believe there should uh, it should take some time uh, before it can be done, and uh, there should be organic reduction probably of the deposits, but also uh, with the restriction on lending, uh, at least the restriction on lending to state-owned enterprises, uh, because we really don't want it uh, to to actively uh, uh, provide loans to state on enterprises and create additional problems and become less attractive to potential investors. Uh, so in Ukraine, unfortunately, we don't have a developed uh, stock exchange market, so selling uh, private bank uh, uh, via, via some initial public offering wouldn't be a good solution. So we think that uh, probably state should look for a strategic investor in case it fails to find uh, a private strategic investor, so then we should uh, uh, probably try to sell it uh, to uh, international financial organizations. And of course, in order to do this, we should resolve the issue with the debt. Uh, and uh, how can we do this? We can transfer toxic assets from bank balances, for example, creating a special, uh, state, uh, special uh, asset management company, which would uh, help to clean up uh, the uh, private bank uh, balance. And. Uh, uh, to summarize my short presentation, yes, there are advantages uh, and risks of holding nationalized state-owned banks, but privatization, uh, to my mind, is the only way to uh, minimize the risk of ownership in the long run. Uh, and when privatizing, we should look for a strategic investor. In this case, of, in particular case of private bank, uh, we should uh, resolve the issue of non-performing loans, probably transferring uh, them from the balance uh, of the bank, and also uh, resolve the issue issues uh, with lawsuits from bond holders uh, and uh, resolve the issue with bank balance structure. And uh, said, I, I believe, uh, although, again, unfortunately, we don't have today the representatives of the Ministry of Finance, which would probably tell us about strategy of private bank if it's already valuable, but uh, we don't know, unfortunately, any public news on that uh, in that uh, sphere. But we believe that uh, the part of the ownership policy uh, for the Private bank would be that uh, it is clearly stated that it should not uh, be in state ownership forever. There should be maybe a strategy for several years, but it should be stated how the bank would be prepared for privatization. Thank you for your attention. You are not the only one who is sorry that we don't have any representatives of the Ministry of Finance uh, in this audience. Yes, the first question is to uh, Ms. Roshkova. If you could try and uh, put a value, put a price tag on bank nationalization, is it fair to say that uh, uh, what, it, what it costs, it's actually is measured by the total provisions set aside, 191 billion as of the first of uh, October, it's okay with some adjustments, maybe around 190. Is, isn't that the price that we're paying for uh, the nationalization of private bank? No. On the, on the question of uh, what it costs, uh, if we're talking about the money that has been invested, we should uh, speak about the amount that has been injected as capital, a little over 39 billion, 139 billion grivners. We are waiting for uh, the uh, outcome of the uh, appraisal of the non-core assets on the balance sheet of the bank, uh, the, the potentially further 16 billion grivners of recap was uh, tentatively proved, but uh, we are awaiting the audit findings to make that determination. So it's just it's fair to to speak about the uh, funds injected as capital as being the, the price tag on the, the entire exercise. If we look at it from a different perspective, the, uh, the task of preserving financial stability uh, and uh, a retail deposit of 150 billion grivners that has been preserved, this is the benefit for the government because uh, we prevented uh, 
a further deterioration uh, and deepening of the financial crisis and loss of financial stability. The second question goes to you too. Unfortunately, we only wish we had uh, representatives, and again from the Ministry of Finance, to the extent that the government is represented by the Ministry of Finance um, as a. Uh, as uh, as the owner of, of bank. Uh, so it's a question probably to the national bank, bank being the closest proxy. Who is currently negotiating with the bank's former owners? Who is uh, responsible for representing the state in such litigations? Certainly, lo it's logically uh, logical to assume that it's the Ministry of Finance, but has the Ministry of Finance delegated it to somebody? No, it is impossible that the National Bank be, be delegated to facing the audience. More, more eyes than more eyes in the, in the in the audience. It's not it's not uh, that there are uh, TV crews and cameras. More contact. It's impossible. Just to go back to the remit of the National Bank of Ukraine. It is the mission of the National Bank of Ukraine is to uh, ensure the, the financial stability of the of the nation and the banking sector. As bank, the banking regulator, the NBU diagnosed the the problem. They worked with the former owners. Uh, they they worked on the financial recovery plan to to help they bring the, the bank back on track. Having finally exhausted all avenues of of uh, bringing bank to normal with a negative capital, then they uh, decided to uh, declare and solve it. Then the state of Ukraine made that call, made the decision to nationalize the bank because uh, the country's financial stability was at stake. As as of this uh, point, the NBU uh, is the same to this bank as to all other banks. Uh, the banking regulator, compliance with regulatory requirements, uh, strategy, everything that a regulator does to keep the banking sector stable. Anything that relates to any uh, litigation or negotiations with the former owners about asset recovery, this is something that the bank itself is supposed to pursue. Private bank, just as any other bank, that has some uh, NPLs owed, owed to it should uh, work them out. And it's management, it's uh, the board of directors. The board of directors is made up of very distinguished individuals, top-notch professionals, and uh, the regulator is very happy with, with, uh, with their work. So it is management, board of directors, owners. It is the, the ball is in their court. And the Ministry of Finance now, even if they wanted to, they, they would not be in a position to delegate it to the National Bank of Ukraine. That would constitute uh, a conflict of interest. So the bank uh, is doing it, so the uh, board of directors is also involved uh, within its uh, its competencies. It, it's just, it takes time. A question to Svidlana Rekrut. Your uh, job is to sell off assets from, from field banks. So private bank now is uh, is a going concern. So you have nothing to do with private bank because it, it, its operation continues. But from your experience, aren't you in any talks or, or any discussions with the National Bank of Ukraine about about some involvement in uh, dealing with with the former owners, uh, in particular, in terms of uh, what to do about uh, the uh, collateral uh, pledged against against uh, the assets held, held on, on its balance sheet. So, private bank is uh, actually a live bank. Uh, so that's why it would not be appropriate to speak uh, with former owners about any uh, asset re uh, realization, but they. Private bank has sits on a lot of NPLs, just as is the case with most banks. Whether these assets are going to be sold or worked out in a, a different way, it's it's up to uh, the owner, being the Ministry of Finance, the board of directors setting the overall strategy. If these two come together and, and decide that the assets are subject uh, to uh, disposal through the uh, DGF, 
at something that they know how to do. They 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 have a working uh, system, so the fund will comply if that call is made. On some terms, then we they will do it. It's uh, we understand that the National Bank of Ukraine has a master plan. Uh, in, in relation to how to work out the NPLs of uh, performing banks. And this is potentially a viable model, but what's good is that the the, uh, the nation, the regulator, the board of directors has at least two options. One, uh, to use the workout mechanism uh, implemented by the DGF, and the second option is what's on the table from the National Bank of Ukraine. Uh, it's also a viable option and an international best practice at that. So hopes that ans answered the question. So you just stated that if the the government were to uh, make that proposal, is that an initiative that you are aware of? Is it something being discussed or? is the sale of assets through the GDF in the case of Privat Bank is not on the table. To her knowledge, there aren't any official documents of official initiatives that have been put on the table. A question to uh, Mr. Lavrinchuk. You, you're a competitor. It is not in your best interest to uh, have the government gain more weight in the banking sector, correct? Uh, some fresh stats came out uh, uh, just measuring the uh, the the share of state banks in administering treasury accounts. It's over 53 percent, which is it's larger than the state's stake in the banking sector overall. To what extent are you involved in some sort of an adjustment program uh, of the banking sector development strategy, if you will, in relation to state-owned banks. Are you aware of any such document being being in the pipeline, the forthcoming? And to what extent are private banks, and particular foreign-owned banks, are applying pressure uh, using their lobbyism to uh, uh, get the government to at least uh, go 50 minus, but not 50 plus as its share? of the banking sector. Good afternoon. Thank you for the question. It's closer to Mr. Lovchenchuk's heart than the previous one, and it's something really important because what uh, now what 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 happened is already, already here. But you you don't want to face the daunting task of selling off private assets, uh, do you? Now, spe uh, the the whole question about uh, uh, state on banks is not a matter of competition, it's where the whole market is heading, is the question. So it's the competitive environment is one that's quite attractive, that you can, you can still keep, keep up profitable operations. So the economy is, is small, uh, the per capita income is small, uh, growth has been sluggish, and it's not attractive for investors as an economic, as an economy to invest in. We are all interested in, 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 in seeing this market grow and develop. We all want the financial market to provide the, tie, the kind of leverage to spur up economic growth further. Now, back to the role uh, of state owned banks. This is a story long forgotten, something that Mr. Speck will remember when there was that domination uh, of state banks in the banking sector. It's like a deja vu, deja vu kind of uh, uh, effect when once more state owned banks are dominating the market. And it's it's by assets, by deposits, and the only beneficiaries of various state-owned, various state programs to get uh, compensated for various initiatives. This is new for Ukraine. How whether beneficial for the market or not is something that has been discussed uh, on a number of occasions. And Mr. Lafrenchuk certainly doesn't have the time to to uh, dig deep into that and and, and describe it all. But it's just a. Uh, it's something that needs will at least be at least delegated. Maybe somebody will want to, to, to comment on that. There's an entire agenda of activities that need to be undertaken to uh, help the banking sector regain competitiveness. So now, capital markets, there is none. Oh, there is none that, that operates normally. This means no access to long money, to cheap money. There are many other 
um, hurdles and and constraints like legal constraints, but uh, financially, financially, it, uh, it, it 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 is it is not not an operational market. Only some individual sectors uh, are capable of absorbing the uh, the uh, prohibitive interest rate, like agriculture. Now, long-term projects. Uh, Delivering them in the local currency is too expensive. Now, by inflation, by interest rates, uh, so our market is too small. We need to to in increase its size. Uh, the the large presence of uh, of the of presence of, of the state and the, uh, various uh, uh, support programs, compensations, and and reimbursements. This is not um, the correct path. So. We are not even getting close. Uh, so the market, uh, we're not getting out of two-digit, um, double-digit inflation, but it's the market is not getting uh, back to normal as of this moment. And there are so many factors at play that are potentially affecting fair competition. This is the a great value that we have here, that uh, competition, fair competition does exist in this marketplace, even in times of crises. And it's just that, yes, banks are, are basically uh, pursue different scenarios, but there's respect this. And the, the mark, money markets, for instance, uh, and, and other types of markets have been particularly active. So whether there is a strategy, whether we're involved, we are involved uh, uh, as a member of the uh, association that's kind of hosting us. There have been a series of meetings hosted by the Ministry of Finance uh, to discuss uh, a blueprint, a draft strategy for state uh, bank development. It's an expert based law which really likes everything about and around corporate governance. So how, what is the corporate governance model that is going to be proposed? How are the duties between management and the border acts going to be uh, uh, described? And that this is, that, that there's no alternative to that. That's, we need to rely on national experience and common sense. Speaking of uh, the, the actual work that these banks, what, 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 do we, what do we want them to do? Mr. Tavrinchuk doesn't have a clear picture, nor is he aware of one that exists that, what, what, what is going to be the remit of those banks in society? Uh, are they going to continue dominating? Is this for the benefit? Is this something that benefits uh, the Ukrainian public? Question to Mr. Speck. No, you see, you're ready to answer. I haven't, I haven't asked the question. You're ready to answer. No, look, it's just, just, just to, to throw in a comment and in response to this first question that was asked. Now, just uh, uh, what, what, just what, what he stated during the first part is that somebody has to uh, discharge the role to protect property. We, we understand that. Uh, often uh, private banks nationalized the question that's been outstanding who's going to defend its interests in court for instance how to uh, who's going to uh, where is the source of compensation that uh, the that, that the government has put into this uh, uh, re recapitalization it's not 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 all of this has been monetized what's the case with nafta gas national oil and gas company a lot of money went into that one now, uh, yeah, you're going to pick up on, on a previous question, but just to top it, um, the, one more question. The, this association, the Independent Banking Association of Ukraine, are you at all, and who is it with that you are in talks about uh, strengthening the role of the state in litigation, for instance, in increasing safeguards for state property and with the Ministry of Finance as the, as the owner of the bank to uh, how we should uh, increase their capacity to discharge their role, which is something that they're not particularly happy with. We, now, on strategy, uh, in uh, very early days of when this uh, Mr. Speck talked to Mr. Malij and he was just sharing his impressions that the government was playing with strategy as you know what as a red herring is something, as a distraction, for sure, to distract uh, people with. So the first strategy was supposed to come out at the end of August 2015. That was the, the deadline on Years on, we don't have one. And it's not even related to Privat. Then, after Privat happened, now, we were back at the drawing board. 
You know that the government is now heralding this uh, by Ukraine and this sort of thing, relying on, on its own uh, resources. Now, more time goes on, the next deadline has been missed. There they go. Look, we're going to hire some international expertise uh, to help us in the task. Are the same people? Has something changed? Are they like, do they not feel confident anymore? Uh, shouldn't that have been the first thought that they were not, they were themselves incapable of doing something? Uh, there is no strategy. Uh, there was a post on Facebook that uh, uh, a great example of landing together with uh, the International Finance Corporation, uh, together with the State Bank, is a, a great example of the strategy in action, not being a uh, a young person might have overlooked something. He, might have, now he writes back to the author of the post, Oksana, is, is, is there one? Uh, Yuri Vlashuk, the uh, advisor to the National Bank, there is no updated one. If there is no updated one, then there is none now. Ms. Oksana keeps writing. We, we are finalizing and submitting for uh, executive government approval. Wait a minute, where is public consultations? Look, you've stitched together something, okay, it's an accomplishment, at least you're done doing that, and you're going to rush it through the executive government now. But look, the, the best journalists have now joined the government as advisors, not, not, not everyone, not everyone. Yeah, with the only exception of Mr. Blino, apparently so. And from their new position, they are telling us about updating us on the pace of, of reform. They were exposing a lack of progress, and then they switched sides, and now they are discussing a reform as if it's actually happening. So the whole reform actually boils down to the role of the government uh, growing stronger, including the banking uh, sector. Volodyma is a very talented and very modest person, but his bank often lands at rates lower than prevailing market rates. He and he's been having to do that, and he's been able to do that, and still earn uh, uh, a normal rate of margin. But it's not because he he's doing it out of economic or competitive considerations, but it's because the government has approved another program to uh, rebate an interest rate or some part of it, and that's after that uh, he lends, and then a compensation uh, is collected from the local government. Wait a minute. Is it because they are now, their revenues have skyrocketed, that they have money to burn, that they can afford to spend it in compensations? If that was the case, that they would uh, line up the, the, the caliber of banks that Mr. Lavrinchuk uh, leads and other banks that just... Is that a strategy? We need to invite another regulator, the Anti-Monopoly Committee of Ukraine. Since July, Ukraine has been uh, uh, has introduced a European compliant public procurement uh, act of legislation or something. Let's look at, at, at at their statements, how how do, uh, does all that tie in with, with our aspirations? Look, this talking the talk about strategy is something to buy time with creditors. Okay, to get them to release uh, another tranche. But out of the total pool of financial uh, assistance committed to Ukraine, the disbursement ratio has been as low as 50%. We are faking activity. Yes, we have a strategy, we're planning a strategy. Wait a minute. In a democracy, it is inconceivable that uh, such documents are adopted without any exposure and uh, collection of feedback from stakeholders. 
Have you heard of the last strategy? Yeah, but there was a previous version of the strategy. It's completely outdated, no longer applicable. Well, but after the private bank case. It was posted on the website, but it was never enacted by a cabinet of ministers' resolution. Yeah, yeah, you see, you see how it is important too. That the, the text was out there, but it was never enacted. That's, that's how, that, that's, look, that's, actually, they think it is just text, but not an officially binding or applicable strategy or document, if you will. So there was some, some, so was it is that we give preference uh, and harm competition to some banks? Well, it's like maybe let's hear from some uh, some other uh, colleagues. The fundamentals of state bank development as a document was uh, approved by the cabinet ministers in April 2016, and Mr. Speck is is quite right. They did not. Uh, grant any proper preferences to state on banks, not in the least. The primary objective of the strategy was formulated as uh, reducing the share held by the state in the financial market. So that was done uh, to uh, to sell this to foreign creditors to get another tranche and then revert to the good old ways of doing it. Look, as the banking regulator, the National Bank of Ukraine continues working with commercial banks, uh, requiring that they take certain steps to implement what's been approved, what's been enacted. The strategy certainly is in need of updating following the uh, nationalization of private bank, but its primary objective was, uh, is not going to change. On the subject of competition, we uh, there's only so much we can do, and it's quite normal that uh, we have our objectives, the national bank meaning and, and its mandate as the central bank, but uh, within our competencies, uh, the, the national bank is working to uh, to protect fair competition and, and without making any uh, or giving any special treatment to state owned banks, at least the market that the, the national bank has a way of of influencing is that along these lines that and Nabu has been very helpful because there were certain types of transactions and services that that the newly uh, nationalized uh, bank uh, was still uh, providing and and then you you did not allow those services to be picked up by other banks and then you eventually uh, forced them to drop that that time. It's like back to litigation. This is an NGO. This association is an NGO. All we can do is advocacy. You can, you, yes, you can only do advocacy work to, to, to get others to work, like the state enforcement service or the Ministry of Justice. Uh, Mr. Speck was ready to meet with Mr. Sklar, but he were, he is not with us. He's uh, giving uh, his, uh, awards or something. So. Under the previous minister, there was one um, item that was very controversial and uh, triggered quite a discussion, is how to uh, apply equal treatment to state bank versus privately held bank that 100% that guarantee uh, to uh, for the state savings bank, should bank, that that 100% uh, requirement would be uh, rescinded. So basically, a shut bank would become one of as many banks as there are. It's, it's the, the devil is not in the fact that we, whether or not we have a strategy. The problem is that, that market-based corporate governance structures are still catching, catching on. So it's 88% of uh, government securities are held by state banks. This is a quasi-budget deficit tool. So it's not a matter of whether somebody is smart enough to write up a, stra a strategy, but it's just whether they are so to, to walking the walk uh, or talking the talk. So the example of private bank is very spooky, uh, is 
quite daunting because they feel that they would not be able to dictate to an independent board of directors and they will be in charge, not, not, not a minister or another senior public official. It's a matter of strategy in the sense of whether there's political will and commitment to treat state-owned banks equally. Then again, they're owned by the state, but they are commercial outfits owned by the government, but commercial in the uh, modus operandi. Okay, maybe some rules of the game apply. When there were 20, 25 percent, it was a different story. Now, they, uh, they've come to dominate the market with a share of 60, 65 percent. And this is actually preventing other investors from coming into Ukraine. Why? Anytime we, 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 we are discussing how we're going to sell off all the assets held by the DGF or the National Bank held as collateral uh, against refinancing loan, we can't sell them off because no one is willing to come in and, and consider buying them. We need transparent price discovery. And it's not property. It's, it's, they are based on ongoing concern considerations. They're, looking at potential cash flows that these assets can generate. We're going to address this corporate uh, governance. The question to Dmitro, he hasn't spoken in a while. You had a great presentation, uh, actually, very correct. Uh, everyone uh, certainly voiced their support for the need to sell all these assets to withdraw from. OK, the state is the seller. Who's going to buy them? Now, on the subject of this strategy of, 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 of demand, there was a plan to sell off uh, Uku Gas Bank. Uh, it's, oh, okay, they, uh, they, it changed the landscape when private, private bank was, was nationalized, but those plans in that light were abandoned that shouldn't have in relation to Uku Gas Bank. Now, it's a, it's a matter, it's basically two solutions. One is to uh, involve a strategic private investor, which could be tricky in the current circumstances, or uh, get up to speed on enlisting the uh, interests of international financial institutions. Talks are underway, as we know, and the Ministry of Finance uh, uh, every once in a while uh, uh, keeps reporting that. That's probably the more realistic scenario. Uh, that at least in the uh, initial phase that okay not not even like because we don't have those people in this audience but uh, IFIs would certainly be uh, in the best position to comment on the, the exposure that they feel comfortable undertaking but this all ties back to goes back to corporate governance if, if, if an IFI is taking exposure, is buying interest in a state on banks, they will certainly have very strong strings attached as regards corporate governance, uh, a, 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 a board of directors, uh, uh, there needs to be clarity about the policy uh, pursued by the government in relation to that state on bank and, and, in, and whether or not they will want to have a, uh, a quality framework for corporate governance. And uh, it's also part of that. When uh, If you open up OECD guidelines for corporate, corporate governance of state-owned as a level playing field, a level playing field is one of the uh, fundamental principles of corporate governance across uh, government, state-owned uh, companies, including banks. Are you hinting at the EBRD or or else the another IFI uh, potential entry uh, as a minority uh, to take ten? It's not. It's like it. It could be wishful thinking. It's not that. No, but it's just just to uh, to emphasize that. So it's something that's happened in uh, in the case of a, of a private bank. We're not even discussing its privatization. That IFIs have actually, um, like in in Volodymyr's case, in, in uh, now it's uh, uh, it's. Uh, Mr. Ablovsky only wants to talk about this from his perspective as a taxpayer. That it's, it's every taxpayer is indirectly a co-owner of nationalized banks, and it is in every taxpayer's best interest to to have fair rules of the game, equal level playing field, corporate governance, what have you. Now, there is a variety of approaches to uh, how banks 
uh, co-owned, fully owned by the state, uh, managed uh, boards of directors. Some, in some, are very political, like Oshad Bank and Ukrainian Bank, Ukagas Bank, sort of is a separate story. And there's a new one that's pre it's Privat Bank. A new approach to uh, to the membership, to the composition of the board of directors. What is the National Bank of Ukraine doing, at least in relation to uh, laying down the fundamental principles of governance uh, that would apply to all state owned banks or co owned by the state to have this level playing field? Uh, corporate governance is the number one issue in our agenda, not only in relation to state-owned banks, but uh, sector-wide as regards the different approaches. Unfortunately, this uh, uh, e e some fault is to be found with the law as it stands currently because the supervisory councils of what the directors of uh, state-owned banks are uh, a subject to a special act of, 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 of special article in the Banking Banking Act of Ukraine that, that needs to be changed. At the legislative uh, level, uh, together with our international partners and advisors and the National Bank of Ukraine and our partners from, uh, from law firms, uh, amendments have been formulated uh, in relation to the uh, composition of uh, the supervisory councils of banks, state-owned banks, awaiting parliamentary uh, adoption, uh, a very hotly debated um, topic. And when, if these, when these amendments, are, if they pass into law uh, to improve uh, the current state of play at state-owned banks, it's not just something, it's, it's not a nice have. This is a clear commitment in the U Ukraine IMF Memorandum of Understanding. So we very much look forward and we keep working with our members of parliament and we're also urging our partners to, to come on board and help us in the Independent Banking Association of Ukraine to help promote these amendments, uh, to help them through parliament. When this becomes law, we will be in a position to re-elect the members of the board of directors of state of banks along the lines of private bank using the same model. Pending uh, parliamentary approval of these amendments, we can't just afford to sit and wait. We are doing something, and this is something really that requires lots of attention. Now, what, what's, what's been done already? A lot of internal policies, National Bank of Ukraine have been already updated to include uh, that, that particular dimension, corporate governance across state-owned banks, together with advisors from international, uh, uh, from IFIs, and uh, also uh, we've tapped into international best practices. We've done a self-assessment of the state of corporate governance across Ukrainian banks uh, to identify any uh, problems or gaps. And a pilot project has been uh, launched across all banks, including state-owned banks. Uh, we're trying to conduct this gap analysis, and state-owned banks are also involved in this. Uh, the as is, the to be and the, the gap and the path, or what it takes to bridge the gap. Not fully only relying on the on legislation, it's not uh, uh, the only thing that's necessary. It's not enough to pass uh, good legislation. It's what's really necessary is to implement them properly. We don't have laws like that expressly allow somebody to default on a loan. Uh, they've taken out, but 56% NPLs only serves as proof that people have defaulted, are, are defaulting on their loans, are not seeking any restructuring. We don't have laws that would expressly allow banks to uh, issue loans based on nothing, financial plan, or when, when so directed by the government or anyone else, whoever that might be. But it's it's been the practice in, in many periods of time. Mr. Skov is confident that, okay, we need good legislation, that's a given. We're going to, to work towards that. But uh, pending that, we're going to continue working using the kind of leverage that regulators have at their disposal within their competences, requiring that banks comply, including state-owned banks, comply in the sense that they should improve the quality of corporate governance. The board directors plays a very important role. but. The role of management and internal controls is equally it, it's as important when they start working in earnest, not just to uh, 
to comply formally with uh, with the law, but simply because people uh, at the helm running uh, those banks uh, become appreciative that, is, that this is very necessary, and that it's not something that will require any additional legislation or regulation. All that it takes is the uh, commitment, the will to help your bank do better, or the bank that you're responsible for as a manager or as a regulator for that matter. A question to Ms. Ruskova. Are you trying to uh, uh, set up uh, a state uh, banking group? Why not put all the banks under one roof? If you look at the uh, membership of uh, those uh, boards of directors, the one individual may sit on several. Like from a corporate governance perspective, from an administrative perspective, it is one entity. Let's call a spade a spade. Why not consolidate then? No. Yeah, because this is something you are requiring of us. No, it's it's a level uh, playing field for everyone. No preferences granted to state on banks. Now. Let's look, let's, okay, let's have some sequence of, of, of things of let's address the most urgent issues first. Now, the future of state banks is something that the National Bank of, of Ukraine has spoken on on a number of occasions. We're all in favor of uh, phasing out the government as a bank owner. The quality of corporate governance is something that we need to uh, build up. We need to rely on international best practices and that even uh, in the fundamentals that the one that outdated strategy that needs to be updated, even that one uh, envisaged so the first step to uh, help phase out the state is to uh, encourage in every possible way uh, the uh, entry of IFIs as as bank co-owners is something that we actually think will be conducive to improving corporate governance if IFIs start buying into banks. It's not. We don't have to consolidate this. Put this under one roof. See? No, it's only only on the on the reporting front. No, it's not a, 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 a timely uh, idea. Probably it's only. Bank wide, it's only at the end of this year that, 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 that we're going to get uh, quality reporting, including commercial banks, uh, because it's uh, they haven't fully, they haven't set aside uh, enough uh, uh, provisions. Uh, provisions. But maybe the, at the end of this year we're going to let's eat an elephant uh, a, a piece at a time. Then we'll look look at at, the, at at this sector wide, and then go back to your proposal. Now going back to. Uh, responsibilities in, in, in the sense that who's responsible for what's happened? Uh, at least three parties that, 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 that are to blame in a way. One, the auditor was named here, PWC. He is no longer eligible as a bank auditor in this, in this country. They lost their license to the banks. Uh, the, former, the former owner and the regulator itself. Now, a question uh, to the National Bank in default of other parties. We all remember the memorandum of the 19th of December, which expressly stated that the uh, state of Ukraine, as represented by the Ministry of Finance, and which was also uh, uh, corrob corroborated by the outcome of a meeting between Kolomoisky and Poroshenko, that by the 1st of July, uh, some arrangements would be reached, uh, a debt uh, amortization schedule and some commitments in relation to uh, unrealizable collateral. That's, that's, that's long gone. Now it's, uh, we are past the date. What is the current status of the regulator litigating against the former owners of Privat Bank? That is not the job of the regulator, to the extent that that is not part of a mandate. It's just that a hundred banks have been resolved, a lot of material have been shared with appropriate law enforcement agencies, including Privat Bank, and there is this impression in the in um, 
in the public that the National Bank is just another law enforcement agency that nested with investigative authorities. Uh, and that we don't have that, uh, we don't have the capacity, we do not have the expertise to do that. The MBU's role is a supervisory one. Anything else lies, lies outside our terms of remit. The reason why is because there's a lot of misconceptions and, 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 and in relation not only to Privat Bank, it's just another opportunity to uh, uh, reiterate this message. Everyone has their job to do, and it's financial stability, yes, is the mission of the National Bank of Ukraine. Now, now let's, okay, uh, not only in the case of Privat Bank, but the, there have been cases when one bank is now, it's, we can openly speak about this bank forum, already uh, in the receivership of the DGF now. They, they sold it to a new owner, and then they did their due diligence, and, and they uh, uh, came upon a big gap there, and they started litigating against uh, that previous uh, owner and and clients. So it's that is the job of the owner, and that is the the task. Uh, it's the the owner should erase this and uh, demand investigations, and then hand this over. Uh, to prosecutorial authorities, and it is their job to conduct their investigation and then refer the matter uh, to court. And then the court would try the case and decide fairly. Now, in this lay of the land, we should work within these boundaries and, and understand the role of each actor. As National Bank of Ukraine, uh, we are working very closely with uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, referring a lot of material, uh, handing over uh, a lot to them, especially in particular in the case of, of Privat Bank, anything that we are doing our bit to help them investigate, but we are not prosecutors or investigators, let alone judges. We simply expect uh, competent actors, government actors, to discharge their own roles uh, while we discharge ours. Uh, it's just the, my, Mr. Lavrichung agreed to speak during this uh, roundtable, but it's, um, uh, it's litigation is something that, uh, that people involved in this uh, are probably it's something that they find relevant, but we seem to, 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 to be getting sidetracked. Uh, it's uh, what has been done in relation to those banks that have been closed now. It's certainly of interest, but the question is, is this banking sector going to cope with the challenges it's facing? And there are several of those. One, institutional capacity, as expressed by uh, bank cap levels, whether we have enough cushions to protect us against uh, future risks. The like and the presentation made by our Lithuanian colleagues. From the experience of uh, our bank is that uh, that institutionally uh, the sector can survive in the face of these challenges. A, B, markets. There aren't capital markets. They simply do not exist. There is uh, those initiatives currently pursued by the Ukrainian SEC will only bring fruit in three or four years down the road. The pension reform is going to be maybe three or five years time that it will it is going to start generating some liquidity. Now, how we, how we, how are we going to regulate this economy without a capital market? Three. Whenever we are speaking about the banking sector of Ukraine, it's like it's not. Uh, you know what? Uh, a family matter. Banking is cross border. Nowadays, there are direct directives by the European Union. Um, Basel, document PSD2, uh, or MIFID, or uh, is Ukraine ready? Is Ukraine's banking sector ready to comply come January the 1st next year? And this is as relevant for state owned banks as it is for private banks. Now, that's Mr. Lavrich should have kept silent all the time because this is a session about state owned banks. It's, uh, coming from private bank. But if they are not ready, then the entire sector is not ready. It's not that commercial banks, privately held banks are ready. We, we, we keep talking about the past. While we should spend at least some time 
discussing the future. Are we prepared? Are we ready? BEPS, FATCA, MIFID, it's, it's open banking. Uh, we are still paper based. We can't discard that. We haven't gone digital, even though there are so many initiatives around and IT. Ukraine is a leading uh, IT economy and well known and uh, technologically advanced. And this is this is industry wide. And then again, back to the question whether we are selective or any way like. Uh, Estonia's crossroad, uh, how they organize their registers uh, for, for digital technology. So these uh, these should actually, these challenges should dominate our uh, discourse now. And it's, we, we can't afford to sit and wait for five years for corporate governance to get back to normal. Even, even at Eval Bank, this it's three, five years, to, it's not that we, we shouldn't labor on the illusion that uh, an, uh, an investor come, is going to come in tomorrow and buy into a state bank. Uh, we, it's, it's everything. It's reporting corporate cu culture, so many pieces of the puzzle. So how uh, performance is reported and how uh, the, uh, the uh, outcomes are acted upon is just to, why don't we uh, look to the future? As part of this the, the, the discussion, but the future begins today, and it's back to uh, the story. Maybe a few Vladimir, you will remember that the, the euro bonds, the private bank, sits on 550 million of euro bonds that were, have been bailed in as capital. How has that affected the banking, uh, the 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 borrowing market for banks? This is not something that Vladimir can speak to. Uh, he really is not uh, aware, not, not very familiar with the portfolio of how it's affected the capital market and the securities market is the the, the, the big events, the, the, the war, the crisis, that while it m might have had an effect, it's there's a, the country risk that actually clubs it all together. We need to strengthen the country, the economy as a whole, just as Mr. Speck uh, argue that the investment climate to make it more predictable. That is what puts value on on your currency. Country risk certainly prevails. Thank you. There's nothing to add. Yes, this within us stole the wind from my sails. It's just it's not to be addressed or else discussed at the level of an individual institution. It's country risk and it's readiness uh, to uh, to get behind investor interests to help uh, and promote uh, the investment climate of the country. Let's indeed just, just uh, moving on to one of the last remarks of this session is just why don't we just pass the mic around and just ask uh, our panelists. And in, in our case, the DGF bank, banks, the association. What, what are your key, not even uh, expectations, but or it's just on, and then name who who needs to do uh, the work, like the national bank or be it the parliament of Ukraine, something that Volodymyr just got a little ahead of us because yeah, indeed, we do not have uh, markets now. These. Certificates deposit have been converted into uh, uh, government securities now that the um, uh, the policy rate has been raised. So, from the uh, 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 reanimation reform package, do you have something to say in that? Like one option is sell everything off, would be one option. This is how it all starts, actually. This is what how it all how it ends. So this entire strategy, uh, uh, not to take up too much of your time, uh, the 2016, it's actually, it's, it's very correct in the sequence of steps. What it, what, what, what it lacks is around that time the government uh, did, did not have such a dominant position in the financial market because private bank is, is very large now. Indeed, 
what what's clearly lacking is what to do about how to resolve that. So there is a conflict of interest that, that, because the government is the regulator, owner, and policymaker. Yes, indeed, as from the, regu the regulatory perspective, the government should, should phase out its presence, reduce its presence in the financial market. But we don't know what the same government is going to say as the owner of the same assets, which would be reflected in a strategy that we are coordinating the activities of those banks, or do these banks continue uh, as uh, standalone banks competing among themselves? Because it's not the most effective uh, strategy for a government to have to see its assets compete against one another. So what needs to be done is to uh, pick up the 2016 strategy and uh, then uh, implement it and apply it to corporate governance in relation to other mm, owners, or else if that the government should uh, really expose it for public consultations to hire international experts to develop a strategy for a specific bank, and that, that would require some contribution from from taxpayers, being we as taxpayers being co-owners of this bank. So we deserve to know, as co-owners of a large chunk of the banking sector. Now, the expert community should also. Uh, have to say, uh, find out from the state what it intends to do. Uh, is, it, is it really going to manage as a strategic investor? Meaning those assets, then the question that comes up uh, from the anti monopoly, antitrust considerations that there's such a large player in the market, or else uh, they state that we have different strategies and different sub segments. We're going to stratify them into various segments, like some of those banks only doing corporates, some only doing retail clients. So we need a, a baseline. Uh, and speaking of requirements, what we would like to see happen is at least a draft of the government's vision of a strategy as the owner of those assets from the DGF. The DGF keeps always speaking about something close to their heart. If you're asking about what types of reforms they would like to see and what reforms uh, matter. So uh, both banking sector development and growth and working out NPLs and a strategy for state-owned banks, none of that is possible without strengthening in credit protection. It's something that the DGF and are really having to face the music pretty much in and all having to work out the trouble generated by, by other actors. At the, it, it's where all these laws become very visible. Unless Ukraine strengthens credit rights, unless uh, uh, the judiciary is reformed to, to give the sufficient comfort to, to investors buying stakes in banks so that there are rules of the game that they are protected. We, this will unfortunately continue uh, obstructing uh, growth within the banking sector for years to come, unless that is, that is urgently tackled. Thank you. Two comments. There aren't any new players in the market, and this is whether it, it is for, for better or worse is anybody's guess, but it's no rather any new actors within uh, the government sector. So they, there's nothing that we that we could expect something unexpected in the sense that it will pretty much align with what we already expect. Is that this is a matter of implementation, um, uh, the timeline, and that is what something that is of interest, Mr. Lavrinchuk. If we speak about the priorities of financial sector um, development, uh, we should uh, avoid too many uh, revisions, uh, such as the, for instance, the memorandum and the 2020 uh, uh, document. We, many of us, contributed to both. Uh, the, the, it, there's no need to uh, revisit them very often. Uh, so the task uh, facing the, the sector and the economy as a whole is a very difficult one. It's sheer populism who claims it's easy. They, the, the plans are quite professionally made all we need is time. 
We are asking for reforms. We we want the coalition to uh, meet their commitments. It's currently they are at what 30, 35 percent of meeting their commitments. There is a lack of structural reform that's uh, keeping up uh, a high inflation rate is 14.5 percent. First half of next year, inflation is expected to exceed 12 percent. And returning to single digit inflation and interest rates is impossible without that reform. NIRs, as of the end of next year, according to the IMF program, should reach 38 billion. Uh, this year, by the turn of the year, they'll have achieved uh, 19. At best, this is something inhibiting the regulator in being able to uh, even, uh, even out uh, fluctuations in the market, something that affects the agency's uh, rating Ukraine's uh, sovereign risk. We should. Uh, Abandon the practice of breaching covenants. The the last tranche we, we complied with that and 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 one tranche and then we did not comply with the covenants. Uh, we eventually abandoned that requirement, and that actually blocked the way for for the subsequent tranches. And this uh, has an immediate impact on gas gas prices. This put all other disbursements on hold. The disbursement ratio is catastrophically low, uh, and there's, mo there's money committed that could help Ukraine borrow and invest in infrastructure and expand its domestic market and consumer demands. We consumer demand. We keep borrowing in foreign currency while delivering projects um, in local currency. Yes, uh, and those projects could generate uh, foreign. Uh, Exchange revenues, and this then this this would be an option, an opportunity for Ukrainian banks to co-fund uh, the working capital that those projects might need, or whatever uh, other raw materials, whatever. We could expand this market uh, in which we operate, and uh, a common uh, expectations from the regu from the regulator. It's well not only doing diagnostics, but do some actual work, not only stress testing in the sense that you should let others make money, uh, operational profit out of which to top up capital with some idea, some understanding of uh, how these international uh, best practices should be implemented to strengthen financial stability. But at the same time, given the current sluggish pace of economic growth, and lack of reform uh, let the sector do business. If we could just um, maybe we would achieve better results. The the National Bank of Ukraine has a lot to ask, uh, or a lot of expectations to express, maybe with specific rel relation to the financial sector. Just to keep it uh, brief and to the point. Now, indeed. There is a, develop, a 2020 development program for the financial sector. It's a high-quality document, and we are uh, implementing it. But there's a lot of work that lies ahead. We've bottomed out. We've survived the most painful uh, patch in that. So the system is back to normal operation, stable, and uh, sufficiently capitalized. So it's because the National Bank is the policy set uh, and initiating uh, uh, many amendments to help the financial sector develop and uh, lend to the economy. And this program continues. This is A, B. What has been accomplished, to which many colleagues have attested, the, from rule-based to risk-based in banking regulation, this transition has been undertaken. Bank supervision is going to uh, switch gears and apply a principle-based approach. Uh, now, we, as we compare our performance between uh, recent times and that, then we 
that the system was reactive, sometimes reactive slowly. Now we are taking some this risk, and even though it's not, it's a bumpy road, but we are trying to improve our capacity to respond rapidly and evolve together with the sector as we respond to cha challenges as they come up. Uh, what, where we need improvement is to to uh, see Parliament speed up the legislative work to uh, adopt good laws and then uh, see them implemented. Not only those that are specifically uh, uh, relating to the financial sector, but the economy is such, because uh, the financial sector is derivative to uh, the real economy. If we are fine-tuning the financial sector while the real economy is lagging behind, we're not going to get a workable system. No. The 19th of December is not only St. Nicholas in Orthodox faith, but also the anniversary of um, Privat Bank nationalization. Last question is not to a regulator, but don't you think that uh, are we going to get a new governor by by St. By St. Nicholas? Not 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 Privat Bank. Now, Miss Pakachuk is is the acting. <laughs> CEO now, but yeah, it's it's another interesting question whether or not we're going to have a governor by the turn of the year. But according to Mr. Smolli, uh, the president hasn't yet made his nomination. Now, it's uh, somebody, we, a foreign national, the forensic audit is still underway. What is the current state of this, of the forensic audit currently uh, underway at Private Bank? Now, on the management of Private Bank, we hope that by the turn of the year, the board of directors uh, will have made their appointment. Uh, now they've made the appointment of the chief financial officer. A series selection process has been uh, conducted, a lot of candidates now. The, the NBU is not intervening in any way, but Ms. Ruskova uh, knows from Oksana uh, Markarova and Mr. Malij and from Engin that with so many candidates and so many very quality, good good candidates, it's, it was a difficult choice. No. Uh, is it, do you take, is it so prerogative to endorse that candidate? No. They appoint first. So the procedure is they appoint and within three months as as acting uh, as acting CEO, then three months, then uh, they make their submission to the, to the and then there is an interview with the management board and this is something that Mr. Roscoe would only wish to see happen uh, by the turn of the year. Now, forensic, the uh, ongoing forensic audit, this has not, nothing to do with the process of appointment of the CEO, it's nothing to do. The forensic audit is a review of the bank's um, past performance prior to its nationalization. Its objective is to identify any violations of the law over that period of time that they're looking into. Uh, it has no impact on the current management board or the board of directors that when it when it comes now this involves a lot of work what quite unexpectedly one is that uh, we had to uh, in compliance with the IMF memorandum we we were supposed to have completed it by by October unfortunately we started late not early in the year but only from what from May this is one the we were confronted with a colossal amount of work to be done there the the, the partners from the firm that they that are doing this, they had they they confess that they haven't seen so much work ever in their life. So they requested more time, so not to pinpoint an exact date because it's been done. Then we missed those deadlines, so it's not we haven't yet seen uh, the findings. So we are working, doing everything it takes uh, to give this a fast track. To uh, no, like it's not that the national bank is taking an active role in that. It's that the, they did their bit by uh, signing uh, uh, that the. Company 
contract and, and collected the NDAs from everyone involved, and then they, they're just trying to spur them up to get them to to speed up where where possible. Certainly, it is the national bank's best interest to uh, to uh, complete this. And being from a forward-looking perspective, we should work together with the banks, look to the future. We'll hope not look back at the past. So we we want to follow through with this project process. It's just a promise to as soon as we get a hold of this. We'll, we'll call we'll call a round table whatever you may call that and then it's it's an obligation to post to publish those uh, findings it's part of the of our work plan so the public will see those findings nothing will be hidden from them not at least it's uh, indeed uh, the uh, the issue of developing instruments in the market is of key importance uh, like the moderators begs to differ that the this the, the financial market is uh, actually already bottomed out that that it's uh, oh it's there are still some critical uh, factors at play so we've only got one bank CEO we had we had five bank CEOs who have heard uh, how serious it is around uh, investment investment instruments that's something that is <coughs> substantially narrowing down the scope of banking op operations and, and its good it, its impact on on the on the GDP. Now, yes, we have five minutes left uh, for a Q and A. It's just to, just to remind you that uh, we are here to discuss private, and it's uh, two three questions that we think we we will take from the floor. Because in first first of it's the question. Um, uh, regarding uh, euro bonds, uh, we wish we had a, a representative from private bank, but the national bank was involved in the entire process of bail-in of the euro bonds. What are some of the steps that have that uh, that, that were taken to uh, uh, protect the interests of the state uh, that one day uh, in? Uh, the Court of London in London will 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 how what how, what are they doing to to get the court to rule in your favor? What is what is your de strategy of your defense? In very broad strokes, is there one? How are you going to pursue this uh, litigation? So uh, it's his understanding of English law is that what's going on in Ukraine is not an argument. Uh, why the euro bonds um, were bailed in? No, uh, it's the Bank of England. Uh, it's uh, to the best of his knowledge, uh, is uh, been taking some some steps to release some conversations have been held with the Bank of England on that score. Okay, the question is clear. No, let's put it this way: the euro bonds uh, and the, the the London Court. Well, it's certainly up to the bank, but Ms. Vyskova knows enough. She knows that uh, law firms have been hired uh, to represent them in court at English law. English law is very different from Ukrainian law. Certainly, they need uh, um, outside expertise. This is something that the bank uh, is doing. When the decision was made to bail the eurobonds in, it was uh, passed under uh, effective Ukrainian legislation. So that the law that described the nationalization procedure, including the bail-in option, was passed in 2015. Uh, a little over a year elapsed, and that law was uh, enforced. And then, certainly, there was this expectation, certainly, that uh, some parties would sue us, would sue them. But they, we had to act by law, meaning the National Bank of Ukraine, the DGF, and the rest of other partners and other institutions that took part in that. So quite objectively, uh, this is what had to happen, and it did. Then this, the justice will take its course, and we will uh, have some some decisions. We we were determined to protect the depositors and which was part of a mandate while minimizing the losses to tax taxpayers without really shifting the losses to taxpayers. We are protecting our innocent 
depositors, not investors, who make an informed and conscious choice whenever they invest. Had the bank not been nationalized, because it was two factors. The uh, insolvency declaration was passed by the National Bank. The nationalization decision was approved by the government. But the government may or might not have done their bit. In the event of liquidation, uh, bondholders would have got nothing, nothing at all. So we, we are in consultations with other central banks, with our partners and advisors on how this could be handled and how this could be treated from the perspective of bailing in uh, eurobonds in light of the BRD directive. Uh, from the perspective of using that argumentation for defense, uh, and that, that would, would be really valuable. It, it's that, but, um, obtaining advice, this is, then again, this is something new for the international community. So we, we looked at, at the case of Banco Popular, and it's something that was very hotly debated uh, at, at, at Basel uh, while Mr. Sko was there. So anything that you try for the first time is always a bumpy road. It's, but then again, it was worth it, the, the, the financial stability first. So the bank certainly does have a, uh, a strategy uh, for defending its case, and there's over 400 lawsuits in Ukraine alone. But this uh, serves as evidence of is that, it, that there needs to be a defense strategy uh, be, because the previous um, owners are on an if they have an offensive strategy, not a defensive one. And they indeed to do any type of well, portfolio restructuring, actually, they never had that plan. They were just dragging their feet, buying time, something like that. So some of those uh, uh, pieces of litigation involve themselves and the DGF, the National Bank, is a third party. Okay. To, to summarize that as a defense strategy, anything that the bank uh, needs to do with it's doing with its own lawyers. So now it's just one more question that, that uh, whether lawyers are working directly uh, with uh, in, with uh, private bank auditors or do they all also, uh, does this involve the help of NBU lawyers? In anything that implicates us both, if for instance, if somebody is suing both uh, uh, of us and the National Bank is also a respondent, then certainly uh, teams of lawyers, joint teams of lawyers are working to address that. Because if if this is like a wholesale lawsuit uh, against the National Bank, Private Bank, DGF, whoever else. But if this is something specifically involving Private Bank, uh, the NBU has no role in that. They have their own lawyers and they're working and they are getting the approval of the board of directors just to clarify the reason why uh, this this happened. It's, it's, it's clear why it happened uh, at Ukrainian law. The question is whether any specific steps have been taken if this is eventually adjudicated at English law. Have any preparations been uh, uh, made and then this defense strategy would, would build would actually proceed from that whenever you're talking about specific steps that could have been taken can you name one steps is what anything can be a step as experience as practices is something that we've been tapping into some of that now we it's uh, the reason why this is something to be asked of the lawyers this is not it is the lawyers of the National Bank and uh, of Privat Bank probably have that um, that answer. Uh, Mr. Schmalnik from the uh, Society of Financial Analysts. Question to Mr. Speck. Most state-owned banks were actually got their clients uh, through uh, government directives. So some clients have just been ordered to bank with those banks. And now the Ministry of Finance is close to announcing that it's going to completely pull out of uh, the banking sector. Who is going to buy those banks if they are only banking with state-owned clients? Isn't this a time for Naboo and other banks to uh, actually revisit that?
to redistribute the clients and the energy market clients, those uh, administering certain government spending programs, uh, when they, the cabinet ministers and when publishing there, it's that they, some are trying to advocate that uh, signal banks are more reliable. That wait a minute, we have foreign banks that uh, and they are better rated than the Ministry of Finance of Ukraine as a sovereign. Uh, are you are you asking if that, if it would be appropriate to indeed establish a level playing field and let everyone uh, take a, a piece of the pie? Since 2008, the government has invested 12.5 billion dollars as of those historical exchange rates. You see, it's just that the return on that investment hasn't been high, but the investments think you've been preserved or something. They, uh, they, they've been getting some, uh, some clients were getting uh, letters from law enforcement agencies asking them to switch to a state-owned bank. Now they're inviting them, uh, those law enforcement agencies, uh, forcing them to uh, bank with a state-owned bank. First, they do not openly admit that, that this is happening or else that this, this is something bad. Like recently, Mr. Speck uh, uh, got, came upon uh, uh, a, a government resolution that was eventually uh, uh, released in April that some compensation would be made to, to farm or something. Now, as regards investments uh, within the banking industry, in this current state of the economy and uh, investor rights protection and case law and practices, they, our only saving grace would be IFIs. If they were to buy into uh, the sector and that they would uh, demand change, and then if, if genuine uh, capitalization rises, not uh, paper capitalization coming from the government, but then if we see more financial investors coming in, and then those IFIs can eventually elect to stay or or sell out. Uh, it's in these current circumstances, uh, while the National Bank is so very diligent in, in reviewing uh, long portfolios, but still, it's, reporting is very complex in this country. We are all for a level playing field. We don't want any administrative redistribution of clientele. We want everyone to be given a fair chance to compete. And it's like it's whenever we are talking to uh, the CEOs of state and banks, sometimes it's uh, they think that some private banks earned those clients a long time ago, and they want a piece of the pie and not getting any. So it's something that we are openly discussing because uh, we will always find consensus among, among bankers. It's just that those with the authority to sign uh, those uh, the regulations, and then it's like if we are poker players, we should uh, play poker. Now, let's. Now, uh, a comment on competition, it's all, uh, these are all very good thoughts and fair statements. We, what we need to give more thought to is that uh, the time when uh, there was a deficit uh, of, of, of money, it's, uh, we still have a scarcity of good assets protected in the current uh, environment of financial markets. So it's, it's still, there's still more money to be nested than quality assets that could be uh, put up for sale. So in this, this uh, is a very restrictive environment that while funds may, may be uh, obtained, but quality assets are protected to be invested into, that is more important, how to increase the, uh, the, the uh, uh, 
the market of eligible assets and so we need to see an overall improvement in the state of the in the current status of financial markets now under the uh, state help act any state help that uh, inhibits competition uh, shall be banned this is uh, a requirement of the law and this includes preferences not only direct subsidies now we are running out of time we it's uh, thank you for your very active participation from the uh, panel and from the audience uh, but, um, Mr. Speck would like to thank everyone for attending from the Independent Bank Association of Ukraine. Please come again. It's every time we have very interesting discussions. Thank you.